Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the special session of the Volusia County School Board. Today is Tuesday, August 31st, and it's 6 o'clock in the evening. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to those who are in the boardroom outside as well as online. I'd like to introduce the dais to you. To my far left is Mr. Carl Persis. He's district representative from District 4. To his right is Mr. Ruben Colon, district representative from District 5. To his right is our school board attorney, Mr. Ted Doran. To my far right is Ms. Erin Lieben. She is our agency clerk extraordinaire. To her left is Ms. Anita Burnett. She is district representative from District 2. And then Ms. Jamie Haynes is our vice chair. She is the district representative from District 1. To her left is Dr. Scott Fritz, our superintendent. And I'm your chair for, for right now, for this year, along with my vice chair. I represent District 3, and I'm Linda Cuthbert. This special session has been convened to deal with one topic. The student learning in the classroom with a well-qualified instructional leader is our paramount goal. Every policy, protocol, decision, purchase, opinion we make supports that purpose. Our school district is committed to the safe public education of each individual who steps across our threshold. We do not discriminate based on academic ability, nor medical, mental, emotional, physical, economic, or social strengths, weaknesses, or disabilities. We are committed to undertaking the very difficult, controversial issues facing our schools today. We do not take our duties lightly, Realizing while some are, agree with us and some disagree, we are tasked to make the very tough, difficult decisions. Our duty here tonight is to explore, to discuss the issue of masking. Freely, clearly, and with input from legal, medical experts or representatives, in addition to listening to two hours of public participation, each public individual receives three minutes to voice. To accomplish the purpose of our meeting, to allow us to examine this controversial issue thoroughly, we must have mutual respect for one another's, um, uh, each other's views in, at the dais as well as in the audience. We value professional decorum. We truly appreciate everyone's cooperation tonight so that we can take care of the business at hand. Thank you all. 2.01, emergency adoption um, of, five point, of policy 503, mandatory face mask coverings. Dr. Fritz. Board members, as required by this policy as conditions change, um, I am I'm supposed to bring back this information to the board so that you have the most current information. And as we go through this tonight, uh, we will hear uh, legal interpretation uh, of the last ruling from Mr. Penley. That's how we'll start this evening off. Um, Madam Chair, are you ready for that? Or Yes, sir. Mr. Did Penley, everyone, can I stop you? Yes, ma'am. Did everyone clearly hear what he had to say? No. Okay, would you um, take, my, have to take your mask off? Yes, I said. As part of the 503 requirements of superintendent, as conditions change, it's necessary for me to bring those conditions to the board for conversation so that you can make the most informed decision. At this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Pendley to come forward so that he can explain the ruling that occurred last week. Good evening, Mr. Pendley. Mr. Pendley is our school district attorney. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair members of the board. Uh, as you have heard, uh, and Dr. Fritz has reported, 
in the circuit court for Leon County last Friday, Judge Cooper issued a ruling uh, in a case in a case concerning uh, a challenge to the governor's executive order of June, of, I'm sorry, of July 30th, which required the Department of Education and the Department of Health for the state of Florida to issue emergency rules concerning uh, mask policies among school districts in the state. Essentially, the governor's executive order required that the Department of Health and the Department of Education proactively prohibit boards from having any type of mandatory face covering policy that did not allow an opt out for parents to elect to not have their children wear masks despite a mandatory face covering policy. The judge took over two and a half hours to issue his ruling on Friday after hearing evidence for about three days. Would you mind just stop there? There you go. Thank you. And you'll have to speak a little more clearly into the microphone. Thank you, sir. That's right. Take the mask off. Go ahead, Mr. Penley. Thank you. The plaintiffs in the case in Leon County allege that the governor's executive order was unconstitutional in its requirements because it did not allow the Department of Education and the Health Department to issue its own rulings, but directed those rulings. Ultimately, what the judge ruled was that because the governor's executive order was ultra vires, that means without legal authority mm -hmm. under the Constitution, that the Department of Education's rules could not be enforced against school districts. The practical effect of that ruling was that boards throughout the state are at liberty as they see fit under their home rule authority to issue mandatory face covering policies, pro permissive face covering policies, or any other category of face covering policy that the local board in its home rule authority may elect to enforce. So that is the current state of that case that is a circuit court case in Leon County. The written order has not been entered in that case as of tonight. We are expecting tomorrow or possibly Thursday to receive Judge Cooper's written order in the case. If that happens, we also expect that the Department of Education and the Commissioner Corcoran, who were the two parties enjoined, um, to file an appeal to the first circuit court of, uh, I'm sorry, the first district court of appeal in Tallahassee. Once that happens, under Florida procedural statute, an appeal against the state stays enforcement of the lower court's case. So at this point, we are left with a circuit court trial decision finding that the governor's executive order was ultra vires and enjoining the commissioner of education and the department of education only from enforcing emergency rules prohibiting boards from issuing mask mandates. I understand that that's a lot of legalese and I apologize. I did my best to uh, put it in li as lay terms as I could. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Penley. Are there any questions from the board? I, I don't see any. Now, we're expecting to reiterate. Oh, Ms. Haynes? Yes, I'm sorry. She put it up after I stopped looking. Okay, thank you, Ms. Haynes. It takes it a few minutes, Ms. Cuthbert, when they're switching from having the video on him back to us so that we can. Oh, have okay, a I see how that works. Okay, thank you. All right. So, Mr. Pendley, I want to just clarify what you just stated. At this time, even though the judge met, on Friday, he still has not issued his ruling as of this evening. That's correct. And we have been monitoring throughout the, over the weekend and yesterday and today, awaiting a written order. The judge was cautious on Friday to say that his oral direction to counsel, and it's not uncommon at all that a judge would issue a lengthy ruling like that from the bench and ask for both parties to submit proposed orders that he can then edit or reject and but we're still waiting for that written order and until it's written it is not a, a final decision of a circuit court 
Okay, so even though he met on Friday and he gave a verbal ruling, there is still no written ruling and it has not been filed at this time. That is correct. Okay, so um, Madam Chair and my other board members, I spoke with Mrs. Andrea Messina um, yesterday and once again today. They have an email ready that as soon as the ruling comes out, we will receive it. And that's why I was just checking to see if we had yet. And she said the same thing as Mr. Penley is that they are waiting on the ruling. If I also want to make sure I clearly understood what you said, once the ruling is submitted, the expectation is it's going to go to the first district court of appeals. And once it lands there, what the governor had originally issued will stay. Essentially, yes, as a practical matter, the stay of enforcement, that, that is a bar of the lower court's order pending appellate review. Do you anticipate that it will go straight to the first district court of appeals or do you anticipate it will go on to the state Supreme Court? There is discussion, I won't call it speculation. If what we're doing, uh, me, my colleagues around the state, are basing our legal advice on what happened last year with similar cases. Um, and in, we anticipate and we're prepared that if an appeal is filed in the first district court of appeals, there is a high likelihood that they will certify that as a question of imminent public importance and will forward it immediately to the Supreme Court. That would not surprise me, but they do not have to do that. Direct appeal from the trial court, the circuit court of Leon County goes to the first district court of appeals. So to kind of make it clear for anyone that may be listening at home, this is very similar to last year when um, the lawsuit was filed where they tried to stop us from opening schools, correct? The procedure is almost the same. The procedure is almost the same. All right, thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Is there anyone else? Um, I have one question. If to continue what Mrs. Haynes said, is there a time usually that's done? Does it take a week or do we have to wait months for it to be heard at the Supreme Court level? I would expect a question like this, Madam Chair, to be quickly argued and quickly resolved. Normally it can take an entire cycle of the court to hear a, an appeal on certiorari, but this is not coming. And if it goes to the Supreme Court, it would not be coming through that procedural route. It would be a direct certification from the district court to the Supreme Court of eminent public importance, and they typically rule on those matters within days or weeks. Okay, so conceivably, this could all be decided by the end of September. Highly likely, yes. Ma Highly likely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Penley. You're very welcome. Thank you, sir. Dr. Fritz? I'm going to ask Dr. Shanoff to come forward to talk about some of the mitigations that the district's taken this year uh, to keep our students and our staff safe. Good evening, Ms. Cuthbert, board members, mm -hmm. Dr. Fritz. I uh, just want to cover a couple of items quickly. Um, First has to do with PPE and PPE levels available to our schools in the warehouse. Currently, all of our PPE levels um, are closely monitored and we have a healthy stock of all PPE items. Um, most notably, masks, wipes, gloves, face shields, um, and also disinfectant. Um, hand sanitizer is also very plentiful um, in our warehouse. And so um, at this time, what we do is we monitor our stock levels, the orders that come in from our schools, and then we make appropriate orders as needed. Our supply lines are wide open. So we're able to um, place orders with our suppliers and receive those goods within 24 hours if we need to. So I wanted to address that from the PPE side. The other thing that I wanted to address um, is um, one of the 
one of the items for CDC guidance, in addition to other mitigation um, strategies such as, um, such as masks and physical distancing, they talk about uh, air exchange in HVAC systems. And I wanna speak to uh, the air exchanges that take place within our classrooms because this would be fresh air exchanges. The amount of time that fresh air is exchanged within a classroom. So our uh, air exchanges take place eight to nine times within an hour in a classroom space or in an office suite area. That is, uh, that exceeds um, CDC's, when CDC had guidance on um, air changes, they recommended six to eight, we are at eight to nine, and in some cases, uh, we can go as high as 12, depending on how long um, our uh, AC is running, and then the occupancy of the room. But based on our occupancy, and based on, um, based on uh, our systems, uh, we are getting uh, eight to nine air exchanges per hour, fresh air exchanges. And then, um, because our set points at um, an off hours set to 80 or 81 degrees, the air will come on in the overnight hours at 80 or 81 degrees to bring it back down to a cooler temperature. One of the, one of the reasons why we don't run air conditioning all night long is because it will end up raising the relative humidity within the room, which of course, as we know, is one of the uh, precursors to surface growth, which we don't want to have happen. So we keep our set points at 80 to 81, and then we will go ahead and have that fresh air exchange kick in. And so it's entirely possible for our, for our classrooms to receive fresh air exchanges even, in, um, even outside of the school day and the overnight hours further cleaning the air in the rooms. There's been another question relative to e-misting versus deep cleaning. The chemical, uh, excuse me, the disinfectant that we use for e-misting is the same disinfectant that we use for our deep cleaning. It has a one minute kill time. The difference between e-misting and deep cleaning is that you can e-mist a room significantly faster and disinfect a room significantly faster than you can if you just do a deep clean. So it does allow us to reach more classrooms if it becomes necessary for us to deep clean a classroom. The deep cleaning process, when we hear that there is a deep clean that has become necessary, school administration will notify their day porter. Their day porter is not there or incapacitated, not available. We, um, that call will come in to John Kraft. John Kraft will then communicate with either the custodial supervisor, Eddie Malave for pilot schools, or the area manager, and we will ensure that that room receives a deep clean before students return to that classroom. Once again, using the disinfectant that has a one minute kill time. So, those are the, that's the high level overview relative to um, operations and, um, and how our air exchanges work. Um, as the CDC does outline that fresh air exchanges are, are vital, um, I wanted to reassure the board and the public that we do have eight to nine fresh air exchanges that are taking place every hour in our classrooms. Thank you, Dr. Shanna. Are there questions from the board? Ms. Haynes. Dr. Shanna, I wanna thank you for coming and sharing that. One other question that has come up that I had not yet asked you, because um, I know I call and ask you questions all the time, was you had shared with me this summer about the water um, fountains and what you had done to prepare them for summer and could you share that and could you tell me where we are with the water fountains so we we inquired um, with the uh, with the local Department of Health we received 
guidance from the local Department of Health that we would use normal sanitizing procedures for water fountains, but it was not, uh, it was, it was not uh, recommended to close down um, water fountains, access to water fountains, um, because um, the, the virus being aerosolized, if it were to land on a water fountain, it isn't as contagious as if it were aerosolized. That was the guidance that I received. Okay, and I know that when you went out and you uncovered them prior to summer programs, you flushed all the lines. Um, yes, ma'am. To get them ready, so, and we've been using them this summer. We water tested every school. You water yes, test, you flushed the lines and you water tested every school. And so all of our water fountains are up and running and you're doing a normal sanitizing procedures on those. So there's no reason why children should not have access to water at schools, correct? Our water fountain should be available for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Um, next speaker is Ms. Burnett. Thank you, Dr. Shannon, for sharing all that. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that our AC exchanges are within or exceeding of CDC guidelines. That's positive to hear. Um, what, I, what I'd like to know is, is our cleaning, you mentioned the e-misting e and the deep cleaning. What is our daily routine? So our daily routine involves um, floor sweeping or vacuuming. It involves uh, desk wiping and disinfection, horizontal and vertical um, uh, surfaces are to be wiped and disinfected. Um, the, the other uh, components um, are cleaning out the trash, emptying the trash, um, and um, also ensuring that uh, sinks and countertops have also been wiped down. Are high touch points cleaned daily as well or even more frequently than once daily? So in some cases, uh, we, do have, uh, we do have some schools where students change classes quite frequently, where students will wipe down their areas as a point of practice um, that is not standardized necessarily across the district. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, anyone would like to ask a question? Dr. Shanoff? Um, Dr. Shanoff, I know we have um, our pilot program. Uh, could you report on how well our pilot program is, is doing in all of these cases, our 15 schools? Sure. I think it's important for us to note that um, we're not seeing any difference between uh, positive cases in schools that are pilot or positive cases to schools that are served by ABM. Um, we are seeing cases in both, in, in both environments. Um, as, it pertains to, um, as it pertains to our pilot, our pilot is going very, very well. Um, we, have, we have decided to use um, the e-misters within the pilot so then we can get to multiple pilot schools um, within a given day and take care of the deep cleaning needs. That's a decision that we made as a district. Um, and so that was only for expediency purposes. It was not made because it's any more effective than deep cleaning. I will say that with our ABM partners, when a deep clean is requested, that deep clean is prioritized, and they do communicate when that deep clean has been completed. Okay. Um, you said that there is really no difference between the pilot programs and our ABM contracted schools. The COVID cases are still there, correct? Correct. Yes. We have 21% of our schools are involved in the pilot. 79% of our schools are, are serviced by ABM. There is no alignment whatsoever in terms of cases with 21% or anywhere close to just 21% of our cases being aligned to um, 
just our pilot schools. There's no, there's no real, there's no real alignment there. Hmm. How often do we emist? Do we do it every night? Or is it no, every other? We, no, we would, we would, we would do our normal cleaning procedures. Mm -hmm. um, we would not emist every night. No, we save emisting for when we need to um, deep clean, and we don't maybe have the. Uh, resources available to address all the rooms that need to be deep clean. That's when for us the e-mister comes in very handy because it does the job of deep cleaning in, in about half the time. Sir, is there extra special uh, time and effort and cleaning given to the common areas where all students are gathering, like the cafeteria or an auditorium or a gymnasium? So they receive, they receive the same general cleaning that they would receive at any other time. However, if we have information that a COVID positive individual has been in that space, it would receive the same deep cleaning that a classroom would. Okay, sir. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Any other questions of Dr. Shannon? Dr. Fritz, any other comments? Thank you, Dr. Sano. Thank you, sir, very much. Dr. Fritz. This time I'd like to ask Ms. Boswell to come forward from the Department of Health. Good evening, Mrs. Boswell. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, to the audience, um, please make sure you silence your phones. And uh, Ms. Boswell is the director of the Volusia County Department of Health. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Fritz, staff and public, Patricia uh, Boswell. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure you, okay, thank you. Volusia County has over 66,000 cases of COVID, 3,271 hospitalizations. I, we can't hear. I'm sorry, go ahead, Let's start again, please. Thank you. 66,000 cases of COVID have been reported to us, 3,271 hospitalizations that we're aware of, 1,058 deaths of residents beginning, since the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> This table represents the total number of reported cases for the first two weeks of school year this year compared to last year. In the first two weeks of this school year, of the 824 reported cases in the five to 18 year olds, there were 330 cases reported the first week and 494 cases the second week. During the same period last year, there were 87 cases. This table provides the same comparison as the previous slide with the age distribution of cases. 431 cases this year incur, occurred in the population eligible to be vaccinated. Presently, 25% of the adolescents aged 12 to 14 are vaccinated in Volusia County, and 31% of the adolescents aged 15 to 19 are vaccinated. Would you please repeat that? 25% of the adolescents aged 12 to 14 are vaccinated, 31% of our adolescents aged 15 to 19 are vaccinated. During the first two weeks of the school last year, 128 COVID-related type illnesses or symptoms were reported in our emergency departments, including our freestanding and urgent care. Compare this to the first two weeks of school this year with 539 COVID-related like illness uh, visits to our ED, including our freestanding and urgent care centers. A substantial number 
of children are sick from COVID. This slide represents the Florida Department of Education protocols for controlling COVID-19. Isolation is intended to keep someone who is infected with COVID away from others to prevent the spread. Students experiencing any symptoms consistent with COVID or who have received a positive test result should not attend school or school sponsored activities until the student receives a negative test result and is asymptomatic, or 10 days have passed since the onset of symptoms or a positive test result, or the student receives written permission to return to school from a licensed medical profession. Quarantine is intended to keep someone who might have been exposed to someone with the virus away from others in case they develop the disease. Students who are known to have been in direct contact with an individual who received a positive test result should not attend school until the student is asymptomatic and receives a negative test result after four days from the date of last exposure, or the student is asymptomatic and seven days have passed since the date of last exposure. Direct contact means cumulative exposure for at least 15 minutes within six feet. There are quarantine exceptions. Students who are fully vaccinated. Students who have tested positive for COVID-19 within the past 90 days and recovered. And according to the CDC guidance, there's an additional quarantine exception for K through 12 students in the indoor class setting in which the close contact definition excludes students who were within three to, feet, uh, three to six feet of an infected student if both the infected student and the exposed students are correctly and consistently wearing a mask the entire time. This exception does not apply to teachers, staff, or adults. Schools must use several strategies to keep everyone as safe as possible as listed in the slide. And our school, school district has instituted the procedures to prevent and control COVID-19, including educating students on staying at home if they're sick, indoor masking, encouraging routine hand washing throughout the day, cleaning of classrooms and high traffic areas. It's important to remember we have to use multiple strategies to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 in our schools and in our communities. Layering these strategies is essential to ending this. Schools across the nation are using universal indoor masking, physical distancing to the extent possible, and additional prevention strategies to protect students, teachers, and staff. Recent studies continue to indicate that this multi-component approach to controlling the pandemic centered on vaccinations and other prevention strategies is, effect is effective at reducing COVID-19 infections. We continue to offer vaccine and testing at our health department. You can schedule an appointment by calling 386-274-0500 and press pound. The goal remains for all of our students to safely stay in school for in-person learning. You were successful last year in implementing the safety protocols for prevention and containment of the virus. Continuing to have these health and safety protocols in place, your school should not significantly contribute to the spread of the virus. We know what it takes. Implementing recommended prevention measures remains critical to reducing transmission and protecting students and staff in schools, especially for the children under the age of 12 because there's no vaccine currently authorized and with the rising rates of transmission of the Delta variant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boswell. Does anyone have a question for Ms. Boswell?
Ms. Burnett. Thank you. Um, I, I heard you mention that the quarantines with the CDC guidelines were three to six feet, and if both were wearing a mask, that that would re reduce the quarantine? Is that what you said? They, if both the infected student and the contact okay. were both wearing the mask okay. during that period, the student that was the contact would not have to quarantine. Of course, the student infected would have to go home and isolate. Correct. And um, of the students that we've quarantined, can, can you tell us the number of students that actually came up positive? No, as I said, we do not, our database is talking about cases. We do case investigations. We don't have a system that will tell us we would have to do a manual count and go back. And I don't know what time frame you're, when, when you make that question, what time frame, like from the beginning of the school year. Last year, you want us to go back and look at every single um, contact to see if they became infected, but there's no a report that we could produce that would do that. That would be a manual count. So, so what I'm trying to determine is if our goal is to keep students safely in school, and our goal is to educate them in brick and mortar, I'm trying to figure out where they've been infected. So if they were exposed to somebody at school versus exposed outside of school is where I'm trying to determine where these kids are getting infected. I can tell you up to the point where the school year began this year, what we witnessed this summer with the children that were um, infected, it was household clusters. There were the big you know, gatherings around the holidays mm -hmm. that we've seen um, children become infected. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Mr. Cologne. So going back to, I'm gonna piggyback off the question she had. So the guidelines that the state, after an entire year put out, uh, the Florida Department of Education along with the Department of Health actually don't take into account that the students are wearing a mask. So these students are being uh, quarantined by the hundreds because the guidelines that are in this slide presentation are actually more, more likely to quarantine more children than the CDC guide, CDC's guidelines, correct? In respect to masks, correct. And so, you know, as I, and, and I'll turn to my counterparts, as I look at other districts, you know, Seminole County, looking at their dashboard right now, which I think we do need to look at our dashboard. That's neither here nor there. They've quarantined a total of 7,000 7, students. So every student who comes near another student based on the Florida Department of Education's latest guidance to school districts, along with the Department of Health, because it was issued by the Surgeon General, um, making us put a lot of kids out and there is no account for masks. So basically everybody goes out. Um, and, and that's where I'm challenged. I'll share, I reached out to the chancellor and said that. I said, you know, you look at the school districts who are having to put all these kids out who really weren't even, we don't even know for sure. We haven't confirmed that they were near these kids, but this is the guidance that the Florida Department of Education put out. And you know, he didn't quite, you know, he didn't agree or disagree with me obviously, but you know, I, I think that's where we're challenged here because we have put out a lot of kids. I mean, Dr. Fritz, how many students have we put on quarantine? Do we know? I, I, it's like 1,300. Yeah, I don't have today's numbers. Yeah, so in, thir in, 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 in two weeks, it's been like 1,300 kids. Right. Whereas if, they, if we went with masking for, if, if the board opted for that and children were in masks, we wouldn't be quarantining quite as many kids should we choose as a board to adopt the practice, which does take into account, because right now what's happening, and you know, I know a lot of folks say, well, the Florida Department of Education's gone rogue, or no, all these folks are, you know, the Surgeon General is appointed by the governor, and so is the Commissioner of Education. So, you know, this is all coming through our established government right now. And what it does is it basically is, a recipe for disaster because it is not sustainable to have a kid, a school missing three and 400 students a day. And I realize that you have a job to do, which is 
you know, to help us follow the guidelines, whichever we opt to, to adopt, you know, but we're just in a bad position because there's, I mean, if you think about it, you know, 800, 900 cases times 10 days a piece, and then 12, 1300 kids times five days a piece. That's what the state told us to do. That's what's on that Florida Department of Education sheet. So we, I mean, kids are not learning. And that's my issue here, is kids are not learning because of this guidance that we have, which doesn't take into account mask wearing. It doesn't say, you know, if two kids were wearing a mask, then one may not or may or may not have to go, where now they all have to go. So that's just my thought, and so I'll leave that there. Thank you for Thank the you clarification. Very, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Colon. Ms. Haynes. Ms. Boswell, um, isn't it true, though, that last year we sent home, last year we mandated masks we had children sitting behind plexiglass. We had them spread out in rooms, but yet we sent all children home, correct? Yes, last year that exception did not exist. Okay, so on this sheet of paper that we've been following since the first day of school, nowhere on here does it say that there's anything different with masks, correct? It doesn't mention masks. Okay, so last year, all the kids we sent home, it didn't matter. They, they all had masks on, we still sent them home. This year so far, we've been sending them home whether they have masks on or not, correct? I assume that's the practice happening, yes. Okay, my question is this. When we're talking about the numbers and comparing the numbers, from the start of school year last year when we started on August the 31st to the start of school this year on August the 16th, Is there any difference between the variant that we were dealing with last year and the variant we're dealing with this year in regards to how long it takes before symptoms start to show? Um, I would say that the variant, the Delta variant, if that's your, what you're referring to, is much more contagious. It's much more what? Contagious. Okay, but I'm not asking about contagious. I understand it's, it's more Symptoms develop two days after the, in, your exposure. So last year, if you came into contact with COVID-19, what was the time period before symptoms started to show up? Be two days. So last year was two days and this year it's two days. So regardless of which variant, last year's variant or this year's variant, within two days, symptoms, if you've been exposed, symptoms start to come up. If you're going to show symptoms, there's asymptomatic infections as well. Okay. Is it not, am I accurate or not accurate in making the statement that last year when we opened school on August 31st, basically we were still in a form of lockdown and we were mask mandated pretty much throughout our cities and our state when kids came to school last year. Is that correct? I would agree that we had a lot more people practicing prevention measures. We were, we, a lot of us were socially distancing and wearing masks, correct. Okay. This year, however, because our state has not been under a mask mandate for several months, our cities even longer than that. And even our students, if in the event that they were coming you know, on campus for summer programs, have not been under any form of a mask mandate since June 14th. Do you feel that that contributed to the difference in the numbers for the start of last year's school year and this year's school year? As I said, the layered approach of using all of the prevention strategies is what we need. It's kind of, they use the Swiss cheese analogy. It, using multiple prevention measures is the most effective way to prevent the spread of this virus. So and when- Yes, last year we had more people practicing more of those measures. Well, because we were on lockdown, people were ordering their groceries in, restaurants were still closed, people were wearing gloves, they were wiping everything down. And because last year when we sat here to open up at this time, 
everyone believed when we opened school we were going to kill everyone by bringing children back to school. So this year, there were no mitigating strategies prior to school starting because there was no lockdown. People weren't wearing gloves. They weren't wiping everything down. They were back living their lives. So a lot of these numbers, because I've had a lot of parents reach out to me, represent children in that first week that never stepped foot on campus. They were tested prior to school starting, never stepped foot on campus, but yet we reported those numbers, and yes, they were higher, but they were higher because they were out living life, gathered together on vacations as families, kids playing in the neighborhood. As I stated before, cutting up a watermelon in a bowl and everybody reaching in and taking a piece, and so yes, with a more contagious virus, we see higher numbers. My question, and I asked you this on July 27th, at this time, do we have any deaths of any children 19 and under in Volusia County? Yes. We do. How yes. many? One. So we've had one death since July 27th? Yes. What age category? 19. And was it contributed solely to COVID? I don't have that information. He, died, he was infected with COVID, yes. What? Yes, it was a COVID death, but if you're asking me what his other medical conditions were, I can't speak to that. But it was recorded as a COVID death? Yes. On the, on the death certificate, yes. correct? Correct. Thank you. I have no other questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Uh, Mr. Persis? Uh, Ms. Boswell, when students finally come back, for example, we, we are into our third week of school, correct, right now. By the second week, we did see a much larger number of students coming in, correct, who were infected. You said there were about 480 some, I think. Ms. Cuthbert, our dashboard was lower on Friday um, of the second week. This, so the first did you, week you of said school, that earlier, when you, how many we had the first week okay. and how many we had the second week? 330 cases. 494 cases the second week. Okay, so three and then 494. All right, thank you. Um, do you have any um, information from yesterday to add to that? Any counts or how many uh, more positive cases you've received? I'm sorry, I don't. Um, have you received any more information um, as of maybe the end of today or tomorrow, of yesterday? Because since we're going into our third week, have, do you see an escalation from, from first week to second week into maybe yesterday or even today? Or do you uh, have that information yet? So if you're talking about rep daily reported cases for mm -hmm. all of Volusia County of all ages? No, for 19 and under. Um, no, mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't want to speak to that okay. in terms of um, it's too premature, like you're just saying the last two days. Okay, thank yeah. you. Because we included, we included um, the data that we had this morning in these numbers. Okay, thank you. That's, you're welcome. That's nice to know that. Yeah. Um, how often do you get a report from the State Department of Health about the numbers? Because they're not being, usually it's a, a we used to get report. them posted every day. It went from daily to weekly, and the uh, type of information has changed uh, significantly as well. What type of information is that? So, um, if you don't mind, I'll just pull out the old report and compare it to the new report. Uh huh. So the old report, which ended the beginning of June, would give you total cases, median age, uh, deaths, hospitalizations, and they would all be county and statewide information on the same report. Mm -hmm. It was broken down to age groups. It had race, ethnicity, 
long-term care, correctional, and then there was a pediatric report. It also gave you positivity rates, daily numbers in terms of um, cases, and then it would give you a emergency department, freestanding, chief complaint of omission, both for um, mentioning cough, fever, shortness of breath, influenza-like illness, COVID-like illness, cough-associated emissions. That was a daily report up to the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. The weekly report is um, total number of cases for that week. Hold on a second. The number of people vaccinated in the county, um, that's, that's about the extent of it. That's all the information you're receiving. Mm -hmm. Then where do all these Cases numbers? Cases and vaccination rates. Okay, then how do we know about these numbers that are in front of us? You, you have on your site 87 for last year and 824 for this year. So last year's was really easy to take, get because we had it in reports, but we have a case investigation system mm -hmm. um, statewide and we're able to pl uh, pull a report out of that. I'm allowed to share data with my partners and of course my school district is one of my strongest partners. Okay. Okay, how is it reported? Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot of confusion in the public right now. If a parent suspects a child is ill and that child is supposed to go to school that day, the parent is supposed to call the school, correct? Or do they call you? In no, they, everything is done through the school. Okay, and it's the and school. And we that have staff on campus with your staff that then work together when information comes into the office. Okay, and then when it comes into the office, where does it go from there? So basically, it would go to the administration. Uh, school health services certainly plays probably the major role on the, that and the principal and the teacher in the classroom where the case is um, assigned to. Okay, so, so you're- So the, the student's a case in the classroom, that student, that that teacher, that principal, student, uh, the school health services are very much engaged into uh, providing the information related to that. Okay, so it's the Department of Health staff working with our staff at each school or is it at a, a centralized area? Centralized. Centralized area. And all of those people together are handling all the cases in the county well, with our children. It's a very valid attempt to based on the number of cases that come in any given day. So uh, we had as, almost as many as 600 new cases being reported to us on a daily basis a couple How of weeks How many did you say? Almost 600 a day. 600 for, a day? But that's for all of Volusia, all ages. We cannot keep up, so we have to prioritize. We look at congregate settings, long-term care facilities, um, corrections, schools, and that becomes the priority in terms of the cases that we're going to investigate first. And that's happening throughout the state because it's unmanageable with that type of number of cases on a daily basis. Okay, thank you very much. You're I, welcome. I appreciate you explaining that. Um, it's important for our parents to know what the, the strategy is and also, when we do have it reported to our dashboard that we post at the end of the school, by after five o'clock on Wednesdays and Fridays, that sometimes that data may be lagging because of the, the workload that the Department of Health has. It's a tremendous workload. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Haynes would like to ask another question. I thought you were gonna ask it, and then you didn't. Oh. <laughs> um, so I was waiting. No, that's okay, Ms. Haynes, thank you. Mrs. Boswell. So last year when you were collecting and um, the positive case data, that data was fed to you based on an individual testing positive, correct? That's reported to a lab that then reports that to the health department, yes. All right, All right. so this year's data, how is it being collected? So last year's data, if I had symptoms and I went into you know, a Walgreens, a CVS, an urgent care, my doctor, 
and I took the test and I was tested positive because it was done at the lab, it was reported to you. How are this year's cases being reported? Same method. Okay, then talk through to labs. me about what? It's reported through labs that we receive. Okay, so then that's where the next question comes up. So are these numbers that are reported that we're putting on our dashboard on Wednesday and Friday only representing children or students that have taken the test at a urgent care, hospital, CVS, wall, like whatever is a standard and it goes to the lab and that's where you're getting your numbers? For this report that I just shared with you for the numbers that we share, yes. Now, I can't speak to your dashboard. I would assume it would be the same. There are some um, rapid tests now that has an app that will end up having a report connected to it that we will receive. So there's a little bit more technology than there was last year, so that's one additional report that we would receive of a positive lab that I didn't speak to last year. Okay, but you are only reporting numbers that actually go to a lab. Yes. Which, so that means you are not reporting any numbers that are home test. Correct. If it's not a reportable result, I don't know about it. Okay. So, because there's been some confusion in this area, a lot of parents are going in to Walgreens and places like that and buying up the home test. And they're testing their children on a daily basis or every other day or whatever, which that, that's their choice. But you're not, if a, if a parent calls into a school and they state, my child is positive based on this home test, that data is not coming to you and you're not reporting it? I'm not aware of that, that child, no. Thank you. You're welcome. So based on, anyone else? Uh, then based on what Ms. Haynes asked you and what your answer is, there could be significantly many more positive cases out there then. And we've known that from the beginning of this because of the number of asymptomatic individuals. And so there's, um, in addition to the ones that are doing at-home testing, there's people that are asymptomatic that they themselves may not know that they were infected. Then those, there's other individuals who decide, I don't need to be tested. I know that my spouse is positive and I don't need any more proof than the fact that we both feel the same way and he's positive. So not everyone who's sick even opts to take a test necessarily. So when we talk about um, epidemiology, it's, it's more of a what's happening in our community, a picture of what's happening, then the, this is the exact data. Um, so I hope that helps. Yes, it helps a great deal. Thank you very much, Ms. You're Boswell. Welcome. Any other final questions or comments? Dr. Fritz? Uh, Madam Chair, that, that is the end of the presentation. Uh, Ms. Boswell, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, ma'am. We appreciate you coming again. Okay. Dr. Fritz. Board members, at this time, um, we need to have some conversation. You all need to have some conversation about whether or not uh, we stick with the original optional plan, uh, do an opt out approach, or do a mass mandate and that's really up to for some conversation at this point but that's the point of the meeting where we're at okay who would like to start um, i would like to have a discussion first um, based on what our legal uh, department has said what dr shanoff has said and what Ms. boswell has said uh, we need to discuss um, what we're doing first before we have public opinion Okay, and then after public opinion, we take the vote. We, we always hear public opinion before a vote. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to start? Yes, Mr. Colon. So, and I sort of hinted on this earlier, and this is the approach I'm gonna take. Okay, I, I can't hear you clearly, sir, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. So for me, this isn't so much about the actual COVID cases as much as it is the fact that our mission is to educate children and right now we are not doing that well. 
the amount of disruption that the positive cases are causing because those students are out for 10 days a pop and the amount of disruption that the quarantine is causing because uh, following the latest guidance from the Florida Department of Education, we're putting out children in, in droves. And um, that right there is extremely disruptive to our community, not only to our children's learning, but those parents have to be home with them. It's not like you can call grandma and say, grandma, will you watch my, my kid who was exposed potentially to someone who had COVID, you can't do that. You can't, there aren't many good friends who are gonna say, sure, bring them over. Um, so I think there's a disruption to learning, there's a disruption to the community. Uh, I've spoken about the hospitals and the number of young people who uh, are very, very ill. And, and of course, those are children, who, they also have children who attend our schools. Uh, and so to say that their life is anywhere near normal as their loved one is in the hospital and they can't even see them uh, would be a, it's just not the case. So, you know, for me, I think of it um, in the sense of we're not carrying out our mission. I think that we gave it a shot. We did the optional thing. Mind you, who would have known we would have had, you know, we would have been in the, um, I'd like to say we've hit a peak. And, and we're slowly doing this and coming down. We know in history, uh, when you look at the Netherlands, UK, and India, uh, that they did have a quick decline uh, shortly thereafter. Um, however, we're not there yet. Um, so, you know, for me, it's a few things. Number one, I think we need to talk about whether or not we adopt the CDC's recommendations and actually account for masking so that we don't have to put so many children out because right now we're putting children out in droves. Heard a story of a young lady who, of course, she made it to school and she was taken to an area, you know, where she was separated from other children and, you know, didn't really, wasn't really told why. So now you have a little girl elementary school sitting there by herself, not even knowing why, had to wait for her parents to come to come pick her up from school. Never really understood why until the parents got there and it was explained to them. You know, imagine being that little girl. And so when I think about the number of school days that are missed, that, have, that are potentially missing, it's, it's, I think, I wanna say I did the math, we're up to like 12,000 because of every positive case is out for 10 days, every uh, exposure quarantine is out for at least five and that's provided they can get a negative test within those five days and as you know CVS Walgreens and those places are taking three to four days for results if you're lucky enough and you can find an at-home test then that helps um, so for me it really comes down to us educating children and I don't think that in the current path that we are in that we are going to do this successfully and we have to do something different um, just as we were sitting here, school district in the Panhandle, they're closing schools Thursday and Friday to reevaluate because they've got so many cases of teachers and students that they just have to clean every, I mean, they're just closing down. It'll be a matter of time when we have a middle school that's missing three, two, three, four hundred kids. We're not doing our job. And to think, and you know, and one of the things that we pride ourselves is saying that we want a quality teacher certified teacher in front of kids. I remember sitting here February a few years ago and we had 220 vacancies. Well, we're down to under 100. We've got the teachers in the classroom. We just need the cheeks and seats because that's where kids learn. We all agree on that. So that's my position. I think that we definitely need to reconsider what we're doing and I am in favor of uh, a temporary masking policy along with adopting the quarantine guidelines of the CDC versus the Florida Department of Education, which is just making us put kids out without reason. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colon, for your clarity. Um, who's next? Um, I don't see anyone in the queue. Ms. Burnett. So I took the weekend to really ponder and think about how, how we're providing a safe and healthy environment for all of our students. Um, so I'm going to read what I've, I've written 
prepared. Yes, thank you, Ms. Burnett. I'm sorry? Yes, please do, thank okay. you. How do we mitigate risk and still provide a proper environment for all students to learn? I do understand master layer of protection, but this is not the only mitigation. And I've said many times, I highly recommend wearing a mask indoors, and I wear one. However, I feel like I'm not, okay. However, we have students not wearing them properly. They're wearing them below the nose. They're taking them off to talk. Um, the CDC recommends, highly recommends masks to be worn. That's recommends. Um, we also need to provide additional techniques, which Dr. Shanoff came and spoke to us about, which was proper ventilation, cleaning, hand washing, sanitizing, and distancing when possible. During the past week, I have read many studies, pro and con, regarding masks, and we can find a study to go whichever way we want to see at that point in time. Um, this brings me back to the fact that it's our job to provide a safe learning environment for all of our students, which is subjective depending on the parent or the person as to what a safe and healthy environment is. One parent may consider safety to include masks, while another may consider safety to be more on social and emotional level um, due to a medical condition. We are not all going to agree on this topic, and we need to find a common ground to offer proper education to all of our students. So we have to consider every aspect. There are children that can't wear masks, and I'm trying to see every point of this view. I'm trying to be global about this and not only have my personal opinions. And, and so I, it is very hard. You know, you have to, you have to think of everything. And when we're talking about a safety and health environment, we have to consider that there are those that cannot be masked. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Burnett. Mr. Persis? Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, concur with a lot of what uh, Mr. Colon said, and that's what I was going to say as well. Uh, just that uh, uh, the uh, the amount of staff and the amount of students uh, that are not at school, either because of COVID or because of the quarantining, uh, has to be addressed. And I don't think we can cherry pick which health organizations guidelines we're going to use for, you know, take World Health Organization for COVID and use CDC for quarantine and the state the state, the, the state the department's uh, guidelines for home testing or something. I think we need to decide, you know, which organization we want to follow and then follow that organization all the way through so that parents can follow it too and everyone can get on the same page. Um, it's not that I'm pro-mask or against mask. It, it has nothing to do with that. It, I'm, I'm, my decisions uh, are made solely on the data. And when the data was dropping in April of last year, April of May, I was the first one to say, let's take these things off because things are getting better and that's what we all wanted. Uh, but at the same time, just because I don't like wearing it, doesn't mean that I can't, um, I do not understand that something needs to change because the data is now going the exact wrong way that we all wish. And so I, I think uh, if I look at what other districts have, are trending, the ones that started a week or two before we started, their numbers continued <coughs> to climb into the third week. We're in our third, third week now. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I can say that we, we certainly uh, were hopeful that we could start the year and make masks optional and things would be okay. I mean, when I say okay, numbers that we could manage, but we just can't manage these kind of numbers. We can't manage it from a staff perspective. 
and we certainly can't manage it from the education side of things. Uh, I mean, just, just personally, I mean, I had my uh, grand, grandchild uh, <coughs> ex exposed, and this is in Orange County. But uh, like my daughter said, when you get that call at night at 7 o'clock, uh, sorry, your child can't come back to school. It's like, what? You know, like, what am I supposed to do? Uh, and, you know, both of us work. And, you know, so, so just multiply this by the hundreds of times, the hundreds of parents who are getting these phone, these phone calls. It's, uh, if, if someone had a, another way of telling me, yeah, well, here's what we can do to stop it, you know, fine, tell me what that way is. But right now, I haven't, I haven't heard of any one single way. It takes a lot of different things. As Ms. Burnett said, wearing the mask, cleaning. I don't think we can pretend that we can social distance in our classes. I mean, we just can't. I mean, there, there's just, we have some classrooms that there's just so many kids in, in, in there. It, it's, so let's not say that. So because we can't social distance, this is where these come in. This is where masks play a, play a, play a major role. Uh, uh, it isn't something that I would want to do lightly, and it isn't something I would do for any longer length of time than is, than is uh, uh, warranted. Uh, but I do think we need to do something in the short, in the short term, and we need to do it quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Persis. Ms. Haynes. Okay, I'd like to piggyback off of a few different things that some of you said. So, Mr. I'm Cole, sorry, ma'am, I can't hear you. Okay, I'd like to piggyback off of a few different things that were said by my colleagues. Mr. Colon, you talked about the little girl being isolated. I shared last year that that happened to a number of our children, including my own niece, who when my sister-in-law arrived to pick her up, my niece came out the door crying because she thought she was in trouble because no one told her why she was isolated. So that happening this year is still no different than what we did last year. I'd also like to talk about the fact that last year we put in a lot of different you know, mitigating strategies, and we've talked about that. And when we voted on June 14th to make masks optional, I didn't think we voted to remove mitigating strategies. I remember having Mrs. Sawyer come up here um, as a school bus driver, and she was in favor of the mask going optional because she herself said they wear it under their chin, they wear it under their nose, they wear it as an earring. But what she asked for was to continue to have hand sanitizer and wipes on the bus. So where I find ourselves, and, and I did ask Dr. Fritz to have Dr. Shanoff come up here and share all of the things especially with the air piece, because I didn't know about the air piece last year that we were running the fresh air. But basically what's happened is we made these optional on June 14th, and it appears that everybody kind of tossed out every other mitigating strategy. They tossed out the plexiglass. I talked about that last time. They've talked, they, even though Dr. Shanoff and his team sent out kits at the beginning of the school year with the thought, you need wipes, you need hand sanitizer. We're ensuring the soap and paper towels are stocked. It's almost as if everybody just forgot about those strategies and forgot about, I mean, last year when I went into cafeterias, and I'm not saying that it's wrong this year, but when I went into cafeterias last year at the elementary level, students were all facing one direction. Okay, a lot of students were facing one direction behind plexiglass, spaced out three to a table. I don't know how many of you have been out now, but plexiglass is gone in the cafeteria. They're not all facing one direction. They're now facing each other. They're no longer three to a table. They're all pushed in on the table. And guess what? While they're eating breakfast and lunch, and or if they stay for the afternoon snack or supper, they're not wearing these while they're facing each other for 30 minutes. So even if we change which guidelines we're going to follow, 
and we say, okay, if they have a mask on, we finally, even though last year a mask didn't matter, even when they were behind plexiglass and spaced out, if we say, okay, well, if they have a mask on, we may not quarantine them this time, it's gone, it's off the table because there's not a single lunch period that is less than 15 minutes. There's not a single time when they're at breakfast or lunch that, they're not, that they only have less than 15 minutes of exposure. And remember, Dr. I mean, Ms. Boswell said it was cumulative. It wasn't a single 15 minute exposure. I mean, just at five o'clock today, we all went up to a room and I may have been six feet away from you, Mr. Persis, but I wasn't six feet away from Mrs. Burnett or six feet away from Ms. Sneed. And we had a meeting and we ate something and we sat in there and we were in there longer than 15 minutes and we didn't have mask on. So if any one of us tests positive at this point, we're all out. If you look at what the rules are, mask or no mask. I go back to this and say, Dr. Fritz sent us some numbers last Thursday. And I didn't get all of the numbers. We got a portion of them. But at one school last Thursday, we had eight individuals that it showed, and I have to trust Ms. Boswell, that they were not home test, okay? But it showed eight individuals on that campus tested positive for COVID. We put out 176 people in quarantine. 176 people went home to be quarantined due to eight individuals. Last year, I've shared this, we put out the entire seventh grade at one school for one individual testing positive. Then we put out that entire seventh grade again for one individual testing positive. Now, fortunately, last year we were tracking and no one in that seventh grade that spent 24 days losing instruction at home got sick. So I hear what everybody's saying, but I go back to this. Mr. Persis, it was actually March of last year when you brought up the fact about going to mask optional. Because we started with an emergency order. We were under a state of emergency last year. We started with an emergency order for 90 days and we mandated mask. We put in lots of criteria though, taking into account our ESE children, taking into our account, because the CDC guidance said if they couldn't put a mask on or take it off themselves, they shouldn't have it on. We put in medical exemptions. We put in and even said if they were sitting behind plexiglass, not with anyone around and they were staying at their desk, they should be able to take a break. We put in that they shouldn't be wearing it while they were running outside for PE. We put in they shouldn't be wearing it for recess. We know they took it off to eat lunch and breakfast and or supper, okay? But where we're at right now is we voted to turn it into optional. And so last year when school started, parents knew masks were mandated. They knew 90 days of mandating. We then turned it into a mask mandate policy. They knew again. In March, I was with you. I was ready to go optional because I wanted optional all along. But we held on till the end of the school year and the only group we exempted from being optional was at graduation. We gave them a choice to walk across that stage without wearing a mask if they so chose. But we held in because we made the statement, kids are here in school because parents knew that we had mandated mask and we were doing all these mitigation strategies. I say to you tonight, Kids are here in school because we told them last April, May, our two learning options we were supporting this year were face-to-face, -face, brick and mortar, and Volusia Online Learning. Now they could still choose charter, private, 
homeschool, FLVS, K-12, the umbrella thing that's out there. They could still choose any of those things, okay? But we told them what we were supporting, and we told them on June 14th, masks were optional. They made their decisions based on the guidance we gave them. The same reasoning for why we didn't pull the rug out from them, under them last year is the same reasoning I stand on right now. We, if we pull this rug out from under these parents, they have no options. They can't go to VOL. VOL's closed. And I've heard parents saying, well, will that open back up if the board does this? And then I've heard other parents saying, oh no, my child's in VOL and I don't want VOL to open back up because that will harm my child. Okay, so where I'm at right now, and I, I am looking forward to hearing from the individuals that are here. I wanna hear their point. I've read more articles, watched more videos than I ever want to watch or learn about this. But the bottom line is, I have to ask, how come when we just made one layer, one mitigating strategy optional, did everything else go out the window? And even if we put this in, they're not wearing it while they eat. And they're facing each other, Ms. Burnett, if you don't mind, this close, we're not gonna take our mask off, across the table eating for 30 to 45 minutes to an hour, depending on which school they're at and which way they have a lunch break. In addition to that, I asked an elementary principal to honestly tell me if we put this back in and kids were wearing it, what's the amount of time they would be wearing it? Now, not even wearing it correctly, okay? Because we know they don't wear it correctly. The elementary principal said approximately six hours. And I'll be honest with you, six hours is still a little high, but we were generous. Well, if you do the math, six times five is 30 hours. There's 168 hours in a seven day week. That's 17%. So are we really going to say, if we bring kids in and for 17% of the day, they wear a mask. Now we're not even talking about if they wear it correctly. We're not even talking about, is it clean? Have they chewed on it? Did they drink through it? Does it have food stains? Okay, we're talking about if they wear it for 17% of the week, and then they go home the rest of that time, and they never once have it on, how are we changing anything? We already know that the first set of numbers from the first few days were cases that happened prior to kids walking on campus. Because there was no way there was any data even reported for that Wednesday dashboard that a kid had enough time to come on campus on a Monday, come into contact with it, have symptoms by Wednesday, be tested, and have the data go to the health department and make the dashboard for us. Those numbers were all outside of school. So I just want all of you to think about that. Like, think of the math. 17% of the time wearing it, whether it's worn correctly, whether it's a healthy mask or not, versus the rest of the time. Because we have no control when they leave us. And the thing that is the most heartbreaking to me, and this has come out of elementary, middle, and high, and I am a grandmother. And I am telling you right now, I would never make this statement to my grandchildren. My daughter and I would have words if she ever made this statement to my grandchildren. But why do we, why, why do parents out there right now, or grandparents, or aunts or uncles, think that the burden of their health, an adult's health, is resting on the shoulders of a child.
Um, I just want to caution the audience. Uh, Ms. Haynes uh, will continue, and then I have mine, and then we will have uh, our two hours of public participation. It's very important that the board here at the dais has the freedom to say what they need to say, um, whether it's in your view or not your view. Remember, we're respecting each other's views. It's very important that we have the freedom to say what we have to say. Um, I know it's important for you to clap or boo, but if you clap, there's also that prevalence to boo. And I, and I don't want, I really don't think that's appropriate in our boardroom. If you feel you do need to express yourself, you're more than welcome to express it outside the boardroom. But in here, we must maintain a decorum similar to our classrooms. Let's show an example of our students that we can do this. So, Ms. Haynes, would you please continue? Thank you, Mrs. Cuthbert, mm -hmm. and um, I appreciate you. what you said because I'd like to get through what. I'd like to get through what I had left to say. Thank you. So, as I was stating, um, it's not the responsibility of my own grandchildren, nor does it weigh on their shoulders for them to stay healthy in order to keep me healthy. I'm an adult. Being an adult, it is my responsibility to ensure my own health, however I choose to ensure that or the steps that I follow. Mm -hmm. What has been the most disheartening to me since the school year started is we have taken young children as early as elementary age, all the way up to high school age. And we've got these young students, because that's what they are. Even if they're 16 years old, they're still a young student. They're not an adult yet. And we have somehow stated to them that if they pick up this virus and bring it home, that they can cause the death of one of their family members. No child, no student, first of all, should that be said to, nor should they have to live with that being said to them. Every year, we have kids that pick up flu. We have kids that pick up strep. We've even had children get pneumonia or a variety of things and they take it home. But at any time, I mean, can you just imagine saying to your child or your grandchild that if you get sick and you bring it home to me and I die, it's your fault. When did that become okay? Because we've got kids out there that that is what they're struggling through right now. We've got administrators and teachers on campus that are working really, really hard to help those children overcome those things. I've seen teachers step up to the plate. They've opened up their classrooms at the high school level to allow a student to come into their classroom to eat lunch when a student's been fearful that if they drop their mask to eat lunch without a six foot circumference around them, and if they get sick. But I go back to this, I go back to the 17%. Now, there are some kids that are gonna leave our campuses and they're gonna continue to wear a mask, okay? And that's the choice that they have or their family has. But I mean, we had, a, we had the football game Friday night between Deltona High and University High. I, there were no masks there. I mean, we've got kids playing sports with no masks. We never followed the CDC guidance last year on sports. Kids played football, wrestling, everything without masks. So I think what I have tonight is I have some questions for some of you. So when you're talking about doing a temporary mask mandate, Are you talking about masks for sports? Are you talking about 
mask from the minute they walk out their door until they go back home? Are you talking about every activity? Are we talking about mask outside for PE running this year? Are we talking about masks for recess? What are we gonna do for breakfast, lunch, and supper times on campuses? How are kids gonna eat in a mask? I mean, because if we drop it, and it's 15 minutes or more, whether it's cumulative or not, they're going home, possibly, with no symptoms, because they came into contact with a positive case. So I'm just asking, have we thought through all of this and is 17% and is of the day, if they wear it correctly, they're not chewing on it, they're not drinking through it, it's a clean mask, it's above their nose, it's not below their chin, it's not dangling from their ear, are we going to change these numbers? I, I really need to know. Because our parents right now knew what the plan was for this year, and this is what I'm hearing. We don't trust you. You planned this. They believe that we had a plan that as soon as school started and we got through the ninth or tenth day of school, because they believe that's when the money was going to come down, that we were going to pull the rug out from under them and we were going to collect the dollars but have no respect for them. So we've broken trust. I don't know how that makes any of the rest of you feel, but all those years I was a classroom teacher, I worked really hard on building communication and having open communication with the parents and grandparents or whoever was raising the kids in the classroom I taught. Because when I didn't have trust, their trust in open lines of communication, then that child was not as successful in school. So I'm heartbroken to think that parents out there think right now that we had a secret meeting and that we planned all of this and this is what we were gonna do to them. I want them to know I have not been a part of any secret meeting and actually we haven't even got to the time period yet in which, as we say in finance world, cheeks in seats to get the money. And I need them to trust us because when they don't trust us, their children can't have the best education that we can give them. Thank you, Mrs. Cuthbert. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Haynes. Um, I agree students need to be in a school uh, with an interactive, qualified instructional leader. And I also agree children should be free to learn the best way possible for him or her as an individual to be successful. And I agree parents do have the right to protect their own children but not at the cost of the lives of other children. Our school district must provide a safe environment for all students. We had COVID-19 last year. COVID-19 was new. We didn't know a lot of the statistics. We didn't know how things would work, what they wouldn't work. We have that information now this year. What we didn't expect in June when we went to an optional policy and we wanted our summer school students to be in class without a mask and in especially in the recess area and eating. We didn't have the Delta variant. That became apparent shortly before school started. We did not count on this. We're heartbroken because of it, but we can't control that. It is a disease that is affecting so many more of our students, more of our families, more of our loved ones. This is a disease that is attacking almost every, every one of us knows somebody now who has COVID and who has passed. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've lost some very, very important Volusia County residents, beloved by many, many people, and that are being mourned. And just because we've only lost one child and a 19-year-old is still precious, precious to that one family, doesn't mean that we may not have another next week. And if we don't do something to prevent that, I think we're doing a disservice to our, fa our families. We need, to we need to know what's going to change the numbers. So far, the numbers are not changing. 
We are continuing right now with our optional mask policy. The numbers are not changing. And I think what happened um, to um, help uh, discuss with what Ms. Haynes has said, when the masks came off, everybody thought everything was fine, everybody was safe, and so did that all the mitigation. I agree with Ms. Boswell that we do have to have a layered approach. We do have to have the PPE. We have to have the deep cleaning. We have to have the e-misting. I'm so glad our technology department last year issued a one-on-one -on -one to all of our students. Our students have their technology in their hands. There are things that we do have to plan. And I think this week that when Mr. Um, Persis and when we agreed as a, as a district uh, board to have one week of you know, time to come to this meeting, we wanted not only our public to be well informed, but we also wanted our district to come up with some plans. We can't do nothing. We can't keep things the way they are because too many, not of, only of our children are getting sick and, and we can't control what goes on home, that's private. But we can control when our children are on our campuses. This is the congregation that they have. They're congregating, they're talking to one another. We must somehow protect them. So I, I do think that the Department of Health um, numbers that are not coming out is troublesome because I think we do not have a true number of the positive cases in this county. Whether it's our adult population, our senior population, it's our senior living, assisted living, our children, whatever it is, there's not an accurate number. And especially as Ms. Haynes pointed out too, that the home tests, we, we don't, those are not in our numbers. So we don't know if they're negative or positive. So I am in favor of a temporary order just to see if our numbers can go down. And if they don't go down, we can go back. But I can't put my head to my pillow at night knowing that we haven't done anything at all to help our numbers go down. And I do think to help with what Mr. Colon has said, the CDC has, I think, a better quarantining um, determination uh, uh, to, to help bring some of our kids back that really don't need to be quarantined. Um, and I think that would help. Because we just can't think of our students, we have to think of their teachers, and their teachers are going home to their families. And they have children as well. I have family members involved in all of those sections. And it's just extremely difficult for all of us to make these very tough decisions because for every one person we're helping, another person is, is not gonna feel happy about this. And it's, um, these are the shoes we are filling right now. But I also respect Ms. Haynes' position, Ms. Burnett's position, and all of yours. I've been reading all my emails up until about 2.30 this afternoon. And what I noticed, a lot of people told me to do the research, read the information, follow the science, but everybody said that. I had to go through that, the email to find that one sentence, whether they were for mandated masks or against it. But everybody basically said the exact same thing. And I found that also troublesome. We are a divided board, we're a divided county, we're a divided state, nation, and even the world. And not just in this. We have to somehow come together and do what's best for our children. They are the ones that need to be protected. And I take very seriously as a former educator. I have spent the majority of my life in a classroom, either in front of the desk or behind it. And it's very important that we consider one another. We have to find an answer. We will never know if the mask is going to work if we don't try to institute it for temporary point to protect our children. So um, with that, uh, I think uh, if there's anyone else who would like to say something, I think we'd like to go to our public participation. Uh, Ms. Schultz.
because of the late start of this board meeting and the late time and the darkness and a lot of our parents have children and it's difficult to travel um, home, we agreed to um, limit our public participation to uh, two hours. That way everyone can get home safely. I would like to hear as many people as possible in that two, two hours. Everyone has, a th has three minutes. If you can have your, your uh, whatever you'd like to say prepared, say your name, please state the area of the county from which you are, state your information, and please have a seat. And then I will contact, when I say I'll say the first person up, then the second, and even a third. That way we have a steady stream. If you don't use your three minutes, that's no problem. That gives another person time to speak. If there is outbursts, clapping or booing, from the audience, we will have to stop. And that takes up the two hours time. I'm not gonna stop the two hours. So please, I would like everyone to have their say. And let's be respectful of each other's views. Okay, first one is Briar Kelly. Behind uh, Mr. Kelly, I think, oh, I, I apologize, Miss Kelly. Behind Miss Kelly is Sean Kelly. And then Bev Kilmer after that one. So. Good afternoon. Please speak into the microphone. Everyone get ready so we can do it. You notice the time right is in front of you. Um, who is speaking first? And, and you are? Okay, well, there is someone before you called Sean Kelly. Okay, thank you. Is there a Sean Kelly? Okay, Mr. Kelly, as soon as she is finished, you're more than welcome to speak. Is it okay, uh, Ms. Schultz, if they sit next to each other and so they can go and just replace the one? Is that all right? Uh, board, is that okay with you? We can make it quicker. Okay, Mr. Um, Kelly, have a seat. And then Ms. Kilmer, when Ms. Kelly is finished, you're more than welcome to take her seat. Okay, Ms. Kelly. Good evening, school board members. My name is Briar Kelly from Ormond by the Sea. I am here as a seventh grader attending Ormond Beach Middle School to talk about keeping face masks optional. The Parental Bill of Rights states, infringement of parental rights, the state, any of its political subdivisions, any other governmental entity, or any other institution may not infringe on the fundamental rights of a parent to direct the upbringing, education, health care, and mental health of his or her minor child without demonstrating that such action is reasonable and necessary. It is not reasonable to mask healthy children. We are not high risk of hospitalization or death. Masking us does more harm than good. This meeting tonight is in violation policy change procedure. In order to change policy 503, you have to go through the steps as following. The superintendent has to notify school board of reasonable change. Then one board member can make a motion for the suggested change. Another board member would have to second that motion. Next, all board members would have discussion on the specifics of the change. The school, the school board attorney would draft the new policy changes. The new policy would have to be advertised for 28 days. Then a meeting would be held here, public comment, and board would vote. I need to be able to see my teachers' faces and them to see mine for better communication. The start of this year has made my education better than last year as I have my right to choose. The moms will put their kids out of school to start homeschooling. You will not be receiving your money for cheeks and seats. We are demanding you keep mass optional. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Kelly, and then Ms. Kilmer. Then after Ms. Kilmer is Amy Monetti. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Everyone should have a right to speak, not just 40 people. My name is Sean Kelly. I live in Ormond by the Sea. I'm a family nurse practitioner and retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, and I'm also a bad parent. Obviously, that was my daughter. That was uh, I was told by Scott last week. I'm a bad parent. Please, sir, continue. Clearly. I have decades of experience in infection prevention as well as management of chemical and biological casualties. I'd first like to comment on the quarantine policy. Cur and I'd like to fill you in on what's happening at Ormond by the Sea Middle, or Ormond uh, Beach Middle School. 
Currently, asymptomatic students that are vaccinated are being given, given a clear card, essentially a vaccination passport to be allowed into classrooms. Non-vaccinated students, if they are contact, contact traced, they are being sent home with no instruction options, no online, no anything. Why are you sending asymptomatic healthy children home? This is medical discrimination and coercion. Grossly, this policy affects minority students disproportionately. According to the Department of Health situation report from August 20 to 26, nearly 50% of white people in Volusia are not vaccinated. That's the demographics they use, white or black. This, and of that, 70% of black people are not vaccinated. So a difference of 20%. This results in a much higher rate of healthy asymptomatic black children being quote, quote unquote quarantined um, while more other children are allowed to stay in school. This is, this is discrimination and it's racism. You, you tout your equity and diversity programs, but you, you constantly divide us. You could find common ground in this policy of quarantine is it. You could come together and put your heads together and figure out a better way to do this. Now, even with my experience uh, in infection prevention, I've not made up my mind about masks. I've read the recommendations from the CDC and the research they used. There is convincing evidence that masks may help. But they said two masks, three masks, six feet, three feet, plastic barriers, no barriers, wipe your counter, don't wipe your counter. I mean, who knows? Who could blame you all for being dazed and confused? What we do know is that there was no difference in the spread of COVID in Florida schools that had mandatory masks versus mask optional. That's the reality on the ground. And you know, that's what's right for our county, mask optional. There's equally convincing evidence that masks cause physical and psychological harm. No science is ever settled, or there'd be no reason to have scientific uh, experiments. You all don't know what you're doing. That's what Ms. Cuthbert said, but I'll help you. You must ask yourself these questions before mandating masks. Do you, do you have a legal capacity? Do the children have rights? Thank they you, they sir. Thank you. Ms. Bev Kilmer, please come, and then Amy Minetti, and then after Ms. Ms. Minetti is Stephen Minetti. Ms. Kilmer, no sir, please, please. Ms. Kilmer. Yes, hello. Can y'all hear me well? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. My name is Beth Kilmer, and I am um, very appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you, Madam Chair and members. And I want to thank you for allowing me to speak on this critical issue because it is not just here in Volusia County, but across the entire state and across the entire country as well as the world. We're gonna be direct about it. I am a direct descendant of George Mason, who is the architect of the Bill of Rights and major contributor to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So my message to you here today is uh, basically your responsibility for the position that you e are in as a board member. Um, if you and the other members of school boards across the state insist on voting to force our children to wear masks when we don't know that they're gonna work and uh, also we don't know how healthy they are, but you'll be violating several state and federal laws I've done a lot of research on this, and it's important that you know what would be a possible issue with you in doing this. It would subject you to the consequences of these state and federal regulations that you would be violating, including the removal from office and possible criminal charges as well as I'll, I'll touch on. Members, when you were elected, you took the following oath. I do solemnly swear to or affirm that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the government of the United States and the state of Florida, and that I, duly, I am duly qualified for office under the Constitution, and that I will well and faithfully perform the duties of Volusia County School Board, in which I am now about to enter. 
so help me God. This is a binding legal oath. And the 14th Amendment, Section 1, states in part, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life and liberty. And that liberty gives us as parents and grandparents the right to direct the health care, mental health of our children as well as the education of our children. And that's what you were elected to be, is an educator to make sure that our children are educated, not the health care. And you've all talked about, and I'm going to time's fixing to be up, but you've all talked about the fact that children go home. They don't wear their masks. Thank you, Ms. Kilmer. Thank you very much. St um, Stephen Manetti, please. And then after Ms. Manetti is Luna Debro. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and where you're from. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Manetti, and I am the mother of two young girls, one who just entered kindergarten in Volusia County. I am also a trained mental health therapist. To be clear, I am against a mandatory mask mandate for our children. My husband will help me finish the presenting what I can't fit into three minutes because we feel so strongly about defending our children's mental health, success, and social confidence that we packed up our family's entire life left our home in Colorado of 10 years and drove three quarters of the way across this country so we could live in a free state where our girls could go to school in person unmasked. We want to use our time today to speak from a mental health standpoint. You've received my peer-reviewed sources prior to this meeting via email. A multitude of studies have shown that masks are discouraging pro-social behavior in children. In other words, they are encouraging antisocial behavior creating sociopathic traits such as lack of empathy, impulsivity, risky behavior, increased aggression, manipulation, and the ability to feel remorse, to name a few. Having worked as a behavioral health consultant in a detention facility that housed sociopaths and psychopaths, I can tell you firsthand where children end up who lack pro-social skills. The compounding effects of adults indoctrinating fear into the children's hearts by placing upon them the undue burden of being responsible for protecting their loved ones and others from a virus with a nearly 100% survival rate for most of the population will be profound. Masking our children is creating depths of despair that too many will not survive, and no, not by the hand of the virus, but by the hand of suicide. That is if they make it out of the cell where they'll end up doing their antisocial behaviors. Recidivism is real. Since April 2020, Wolfson Children's Behavioral Health in Northeast Florida has seen a 300% increase in the number of mental health emergency admissions. The Children's Hospital of Colorado just declared, declared a state of emergency from youth mental health. Our youth are in crisis throughout the country, and it continues to be overlooked amid a surge in behavioral health issues that have overwhelmed Children's Hospital across the country. Just Duval Public Schools in 2019 showed nearly 40% of the high school students reported feeling extended feelings of sadness or hopelessness, with 23% of those teens saying, they had seriously considered suicide and 19% having attempted it in the previous year. It's not just affecting the teens. The same survey revealed that 21% of the DCPS middle school students had considered suicide with 16% having attempted. Our youth were already in crisis and sadly those numbers have likely doubled since 2019. To speak to your point, no one is listening to the organizations that are defending the children's mental health. Why isn't student mental health a grave point of concern? Thank you for your time. My husband will finish presenting more of the data that I've compiled. Thank you very much. Mr. Manetti. My name is Stephen Manetti. I am Amy's wife. Our Volusia County Children Next. The CDC released an alarming report showing the suicide attempts by teenage girls have jumped by 51% compared with 2009. What is a mental health crisis for Florida's children? It means that suicide will become the leading cause of death for children starting at age 10. Let that sink in, just like it has in Colorado. It means that emergency department visits due to severe anxiety and depression, feeling of isolation, disconnectedness, and hopelessness will go up 72% across the system compared to the same time period in 2019. 
just like you have in Colorado. Do you want to ask my girls? Those numbers are skyrocketing because children's ability to recognize emotions accurately is significantly related to social adjustment more towards the girls. Girls who are better able to identify facial expressions are shown to have lower social anxiety and higher self-worth. When we mask them, we remove that opportunity to learn these critical life skills. And it's not just impacting the girls. Seven-year-old children who have more difficulty identifying emotions and faces are more likely to have more problems overall, more specifically with peer relationships among boys and with learning difficulties among girls. It's also been shown that being able to recognize the facial expression of fear is a better predictor of pro-social behavior than even gender, mood, or scores on an empathy scale. Moreover, studies indicate that accurate decoding of subtle facial expressions in our children is already slow to develop. Now put a mask on that. Without learning these fundamental skills, we will lose too many of our children to suicide or to high-risk behavior. As parents and guardians, we are tasked with the essential responsibility of protecting and guarding the mental health of our children. Our educational institution, who we allow for seven hours a day to be the handlers of that great responsibility, need also to look out for the current and future emotional wellness of our kids. My wife and I implore you to protect society's most valuable asset, children and their mental health. They are our future. You can do that by voting no on a mandatory mask. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Luna Debro, and then after Luna is Sydney Smith, and then Tara McNaughton. Okay, speak into the microphone. Okay, you're fine. Just pretend you're talking to your mom. Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Luna Diabro, and I'm in third grade at Coronado Beach. I don't want to wear a mask because it's hard to breathe, and you need to breathe fresh air. We need to be free. You, you're breaking the law if we wear wear mask again. Thank you very much. Are you all finished? All right. Thank you. I appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you very much. Miss Sydney Smith and then Tara McNaughton after Miss McNaughton is Miss uh, Maxwell, Dr. Deborah Maxwell. Good evening, Miss Smith. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm Sydney Smith and I'm a high school student in the Bush County school system. Every day, my parents send me to school for an education. They raise me to be a critical thinker. That includes listening to and processing information on both sides of an issue, then doing my own research to come to my own conclusion. Last year, I chose to take FLVS classes because I did not want to deal with losing out on my education due to quarantine. I took classes with an EOC and needed to master that material. This year, I have more rigorous classes that are tied to a graduation requirement and future scholarship opportunities based on my GPA. Missing instruction is not an option, especially when it may impact students who are not showing symptoms. Last year, I had a high school friend quarantined on three occasions. This is over 40 days of missed instruction. She is an A student and she suffered. I've always had amazing teachers and feel that they care about me, but you cannot expect them to teach from home while they have students in class. It is not the same. You decided to have optional masks this summer. If you vote for a mandate tonight, I will be forced to make a decision to protect my education. Being sent home is not an option if I'm healthy. And since it's not your business if I've been vaccinated, I take the chance of getting sent home for 10 days. I was offended by your comments about my parents' bad parenting, Dr. Fritz. It's, not, uh, it's your loss not getting to know them. They've always had my best interests at hand and it never wavers. At least I will always trust they, they will do what's best for me. Take a stand for something and own it. It would be great for you to defend a position that allows me and my parents to do the choice what's best for my health. The education part is up to you, but please leave the medical part to my parents. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you very much, Sydney. Tara McNaughton, and then after Tara is Deborah Maxwell. 
Good evening. Um, hi. Uh, I just want to say you can probably fix the number of kids quarantined by fixing your system and guidelines and how masks are figured in the equation. Masks are the problem. Um, I want to say this too. May of this year, the CDC published a large-scale study of COVID transmission in schools. It included 90,000 students in 169 Georgia schools for a period of one month. The CDC found that statistically, there was no significance, no significant difference in schools that required students to wear masks compared to schools where masks were optional. Where is that in the news? Oh, it doesn't fit the narrative, so. I wanna say that the CDC is untrustworthy in the reporting and the recommendations. It doesn't take a, science, a rocket scientist to see that nor to see through several of the people sitting on this board both lack integrity. Last year was a lot different. We were in a state of emergency. None of us knew what we were dealing with, but we followed code and we trusted. And every time you revisited removing the mask mandate, you said that all parents knew masks would be mandated and you didn't want to pull the rug out from underneath of them. This year, we the parents had a choice to send our kids to school or to teach them online. On June 14th, you voted masks were optional, so we sent our kids back to school. You didn't go back on your decision last year, so why are you contemplating doing that this year? And Mr. Persis, I have something to say to you. The Sunshine Law prohibits board members from communicating outside of meetings to influence each other, yet you did a public interview. Stating details jaded with your opinion and even making it sound like a mask mandate was a done deal. That was unlawful and it was manipulative and surely affected the turnout today because many figure, why go? Their minds are already made up. There should be consequences to those actions. And comments about if masks save one child, it's worth it, and we need to protect the lives of our, ch of our teachers. Well, in 2019, 2020, 434 children died of the flu. Now, of the 600,000 COVID deaths, 400 were children. The fact is more kids died from flu and pneumonia than COVID. Where were the mask ma mandates and the worry and the concern then? And if this was so bad and everyone was so fearful, I believe you would all be in respirators. You all don't follow the science. Your decisions are based on politics, fear, emotion, and politics. I sent you all a video of an industrial hygienist, 19 years in occupational and environmental toxicology as a senior IH. She's a core credentialed expert. She won numerous cases because the science is on her, si on her side. Hospitals can't even be built without an IH. They are the subject matter experts when it comes to masks, yet no governing authorities consult any of them. She stated masks have zero efficacy and the COVID viruses are aerosoled and one mic COVID micron is 40,000 times smaller in area than the cross section of a human hair. Masks don't stop the virus. Okay, so I'm just curious if any of you looked into the solutions that she suggested, because she did. Um, but I know that you're not, your minds were already made up. But I want to say this. Um, it's not over. The Parents' Bill of Rights will stand. Um, if you approve a mask mandate today, you will regret it. Thank you very much, Ms. McNaughton. Dr. Uh, Deborah Maxwell, and then Steve Friend, and then Scott Clearly. Good evening, um, doctor. Please speak. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Dr. Deborah Maxwell. I live in DeLand, and I have grandchildren in the school system. So thank you for hearing me today, and I am here to ask you to keep the mask uh, policy optional. Um, with the, the ma'am, would you pass those folders? Uh, I brought folders for you each, and I just prepared a document, and it sounds like from your comments that you've already read um, some pro and con comments, but I would remind you that uh, wearing mask is risky because you minimize you start to um, run down your oxygen level in your blood, that's hypoxia, and that you end up uh, suffering, uh, uh, your immune system suffers. Then there's carbon dioxide, which will elevate, and that can lead to shortness of breath and also lightheadedness. Also headaches. The masks themselves can irritate your skin. Furthermore, you mentioned that the, um, um, I think someone mentioned that the masks themselves can house bacterial um, infection and microbes. So there's great risk to long-term wearing of masks. And it was also mentioned about the developmental um, uh, changes that, or the, uh, the ongoing development of our children. 
them being impaired in their ability to read the emotions of the teacher. And there's a lot of, and, and educators are here. I'm an educator. Um, I'm also a research chemist. But the, the point of it is, is you communicate so much through your face. And the ch children don't interact the same way when um, they are denied the look of their teacher. And even from the teacher, the teacher is not able to read the child. So these are great impairments to the education. And also, if we look at um, the spread of COVID, the children might get the COVID, but then they recover so much quicker. And we need to let herd immunity enter into the picture and be uh, playing a part in helping us to learn how to uh, resist COVID. And that is a part of allowing us to maybe be exposed to it. Uh, we don't even discuss some of those very well understood biological principles. So please, I ask you to keep the policy like it is. Um, it's 0.01% of the school population that were those COVID cases. How many have the flu? How many have the stomach virus? So that's my point. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Maxwell. Yes. Mr. Steve Friend, and then after Mr. Friend is Scott Clearly. After Scott Clearly is Elizabeth Atley Hall. Good evening. My name is Steve Friend. My son is a second grader at Cypress Creek in Port Orange. I'm here to provide more information about COVID and explain why, regardless of your decision tonight, my son will not be complying with any mask mandates under any circumstances. Number one, COVID is not statistically dangerous to children. According to the most recent data from the CDC, 385 children under the age of 18 have died with COVID since the outbreak began. This is a subgroup of 73 million people. This means an American child under the age of 18 has a 0.00047% chance of dying with COVID. I'm sure others will cover the other diseases and how they are more prevalent, but I would like to make the point that to put things in perspective, NASA recently announced a one in 1,750 chance that the asteroid Bennu will collide with Earth by the year 2300. That means that in America, there's a 12,000% more likely chance the Earth will suffer an extinction lever meteor strike than a child will die with COVID. Maybe we should mandate helmets to protect against the asteroid. Number two, masks are ineffective. Last week, Canada released the results of a mannequin study. As we all know, mannequins do not move, breathe, speak, or remove their masks to eat. Despite these pristine conditions, the study found that cloth masks failed to filtrate 90% of the COVID particles. Number three, masks are damaging to children. In 2013, a study was put was put in the American Journal of Infection Control and it found that a sample of nurses experienced significant increases in carbon dioxide levels and complaints of headaches, lightheadedness, and difficulty communicating. Oxygen deprivation is worse for children while their bodies are still growing. And this doesn't account for the negative psychological effects masks have on children. Students associate school with the act of being forced to wear a mask, which most of them see as a significant discomfort and thus greatly negatively impacts their view of school in general. Kids learn to view their classmates as potential vectors of disease instead of lifelong friends. They learn that no classroom achievement will ever earn them the smile of approval from their teachers. And they learn that the very air they breathe could potentially be killing them. It's clear that the chairwoman has already decided to approve a mass mandate. But I pray that my statements tonight here will help guide the rest of the members of this board to come to the correct decision to reject anti-scientific, immoral, tyrannical mass mandates in our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friend. Uh, Scott Clearly. Then after Mr. Clearly is Elizabeth Atley Hall and then Ellen Wintermuth. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Scott Cleary. Um, I hail from District 3. Good evening, board members and Dr. Fritz. I'm not here to tell you masks work. Even if you don't admit it, you know they do. 
nor will I threaten to vote you out or give you reasons to do what you already know is right. What I will do is ask that you consider, when you retire from public life years from now, do you want this vote to weigh on your conscience? Because who you are is defined not by what you say, but by where you stand. No matter how much you care and how much you say you are doing the right and virtuous thing, in the end, virtue is only virtue in extremis. You know deep down, doing everything you can, for as long as you can, to protect as many students as you can, no matter the cost, as it is the only decision you can defend in the world to come. Don't let fear lead you to a choice you may not be able to live with. I am asking you to think. Let facts matter more than fear or threats. Some of you think the public is against masks. <laughs> Never before has it been more important to consider the source. You should know this is about some you should know this is about some of these so-called Facebook group forums. One is run by a self-professed bigot and an avowed opponent to public schools. The other, a would-be school board candidate who boots people from her group who disagrees with her and only got her digital soapbox because she was handpicked by the founder to take it over only days before the con he was arrested and then later convicted as a pedophile. Finally, as for those astroturf anarchist groups that cloak themselves ironically with words like freedom and liberty, fear not. They will find something else to focus on during their two minute hates. The majority is waiting for you to do the right thing. Protect our schools and make masks mandatory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cleary. Um, Ms. Elizabeth Atley Hall. Atley Hall. I'm in District 1, DeLand, 16 years. Um, we've been in school for two weeks, and our numbers are way over where they were last year at this time. And we are now operating with more students and essentially zero safety protocols in place. What we are doing is taking reactionary measures such as quarantine as opposed to proactive measures such as universal masking. Enacting a universal mandate will keep our quarantine numbers lower keep our kids in school, and our rate of inf infection low. Two of my kids have already been subject to a quarantine. My kids know how to wear a mask, by the way, Ms. Haynes, um, because I've taught them, and I thoroughly wash their masks every e evening like a responsible parent would. No reason we can't do this. Also, my kids don't have a choice this year because the programs that they have chosen aren't offered online. When members of a community choose personal freedom above the well-being of individuals, families, and children, the community must rely upon a governing body such as the Volusia County School Board to establish policies for the good of the community. There is ample evidence that face coverings help to protect our community, especially those in our community who are most vulnerable, those who have not been vaccinated against COVID-19, our youngest children. I have two of them. There is no legitimate evidence to suggest that face coverings can harm our children. It is not about trust, but due to the rise in the prevalence of the Delta variant of COVID-19, current CDC guidance states that all people aged two and older who are not fully vaccinated should wear masks at school. I regard the recommendations of the scientists and researchers of the Centers for Disease Control of the United States to be authoritative and valid. The desire of some to exercise their personal freedom at the expense of the well-being of others is not a valid argument to disregard the clear and proven protection that face coverings provide against the dangerous disease that continues to plague our community at a now increasing rate. Please establish and enforce a mask mandate for our K through 12 schools. Two children have died up in Tallahassee, one third grader, another child under five. The superintendent of that district has made masks mandatory with opt-outs only from licensed physicians or psychologists. We found out this evening one child has died here in Volusia County. Are we gonna wait until more children die before we institute universal masking? 
My children have a right to attend school with every reasonable protocol in place to protect their safety and well-being. You have a responsibility here. Masks are reasonable way to lower the spread and prevent illness, especially when there's no distancing and more children in the classrooms. When a parent chooses no mask for their kid, it places my kids at risk. It's a well-known fact that the masks work best when everyone is participating. We should be relying on Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Ms. Atley Hall, I apologize. I'm sorry. Your time is over. I apologize. Thank you. I apologize. Um, next one is Ms. Ellen uh, Wintermouth. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And then Jack Ridington. And then after Mr. Ridington is Sue Gunther. Good evening. My name is Ellen Wintermouth, and I'm from the Ormond Beach area. I'm a registered cardiopulmonary technologist and I've worked 35 years in various hospitals in Florida, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. I come before you this evening to dispel the common myths regarding the wearing of masks with using evidence-based information acquired from Dr. Kimberly Dickerson at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and Dr. Teresa Gilbert from the uh, University of Cincinnati. There have been many concerns that face masks can reduce oxygen intake that we heard earlier and can lead to low bl blood oxygen levels low known as hypoxia. However, masks are made from breathable materials that will not block the oxygen for a child's needs. Masks will not affect a child's ability to learn or focus in school. The vast majority of children at age two or older can safely wear a face mask for extended periods of time. This includes children with many medical conditions. Wearing a face mask will not affect a child's lungs from developing normally. This is because the oxygen flows through and around the mask while blocking the spray of spit and respiratory droplets that may contain the virus. Keeping a child's lungs healthy is important, which includes preventing infections like COVID. There have also been false reports that face masks can lead to carbon dioxide poisoning from rebreathing the air we normally breathe out. This is simply not true. Carbon dioxide molecules are very tiny, even smaller than the respiratory droplets. They cannot be trapped by breathable materials like cloths or disposable masks. In fact, the surgeons wear tight-fitting masks all day as part of their job without any harm. However, children under two years of age should not wear masks since they may not be able to remove them without help. Children with severe breathing problems or cognitive impairments may also have a hard time tolerating the face mask and extra precautions might be needed in those cases. Dr. Gretchen Marsh, a clinical psychologist from Texas, says there's no credible sources showing a link between wearing masks and mental health problems or developmental delays in our children. She's more worried about them being isolated, more screen time, more social media, and more anxiety about getting sick or getting someone else sick. She worries that children feel that they can only take so much, and she's not a bit concerned about the wearing of masks causing psychological problems in children. In conclusion, I believe that the anti-mask parents haven't seen the severe disease and COVID death that others in hospitals see daily. These people are so angry at being asked to even Thank acknowledge you. that this is real. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate you coming tonight. Mr. Uh, Ridington, then Sue Gunther, and then Jocelyn uh, Koken. So Jack Ridington, Edgewater. <laughs> in Sunday's Daytona Beach News Journal, Mark Lane excoriated Governor Ron DeSantis for both his arrogance and his lack of compassion. Aware that DeSantis is warming up for a presidential bid in 24, Lane commented that the governor wasn't exactly acting presidential. I would submit the governor wasn't acting gubernatorial. Who in his right mind, with his state close to topping the charts in COVID infections and deaths, would callously, inconsiderately, and arguably criminally institute a mask ban? A ban? instead of allowing the school districts and the school boards to make their own decision, which is their uh, right to do. Uh, but he's not in charge here. You are in charge. 
Your job is to provide a high quality education, but before you do that, you have to ensure the health, the health and the safety of every child in your care. Shame on any of you who thinks of buying into this nonsense about liberty and freedom. This should not be about politics. It should not be about culture wars. This is about the most extreme pandemic this country and the world have faced in 100 years. This is about life and quite probably death. Now, three of you are educators and two of you are members of the medical community. I know damn well that you didn't fall asleep in science class. I know damn well that Sir, each one of you your in language. your heart. Your language, please. Thank I, you. I apologize. And I apologize to everybody in the room got carried away. Uh, that um, that you didn't fall asleep in science class and that you know that the science behind masks is correct and it's undeniable. You did take an oath. Someone mentioned your oath. You did take an oath. And that oath requires that you look again at the safety and the health of the children in your charge. The governor, when asked why he was against masks, said that he wanted to see his children smile. If he wants to make light of that, that's his business. And if the Moms for Liberty want to invest in his foolishness, that's their business. But there is one thing that is patently clear. No one has the right to critically endanger anyone else's child. So Ron is not in charge here, you are. Tell Ron what he can do with his mask ban. Pass the mask mandate now. Thank you, Mr. Reidington. Ms. Sue Gunter, and after Ms. Gunter is Jocelyn Koken and then Reese White. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Sue Gentner. I am a retired New York public school teacher as well as a retired Volusia County School Board employee. I live by the motto that we are our brother's keeper. Although most of us here in Florida are from elsewhere, we here in Volusia County are a community of people who take care of each other. How serendipitous is today's Daytona Beach News Journal headline, Unnecessary Suffering. Indeed. Just because Volusia County Schools started later than other districts, we cannot be complacent. We must not be complacent. Without masks, students are already getting needlessly infected. The sad truth is that some may die. Belatedly, we must be proactive to protect our most vulnerable. Many wonderful memories are made throughout our school years. How tragic for a child to be told a classmate has died and won't be coming back to school ever. So I propose to you school board members that the best way to get rid of masks is to wear one. Pass the mask mandate now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Gunter. Uh, Jocelyn Koken, then Reese White, and then Melissa White. Good evening. Make sure you um, talk into the microphone okay. so we can all hear you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Koken, and I'm here uh, tonight advocating for Thank the you. rights of parents to choose what is best for their children. Um, I have two beautiful young men growing up here in Volusia County Schools. Uh, most of us here advocating against mask mandates for our schools are, as per the usual, painted as unreasonable, headstrong, and backwards. Uh, the truth is that masks have created real harm to the American psyche and that of our children and provide little to no medical benefit. According to statements made by both the U.S. Surgeon General and the CDC at the start of the pandemic, masks are not effective in preventing the general public from catching coronavirus. And therefore, from jump, there was a large credibility deficit. Uh, there were six international studies summarized by the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, which showed that masks alone have no significance in interrupting the spread in the general population. Um, in addition, they stated that despite two decades of pandemic preparedness, there is considerable uncertainty as to the value of wearing masks and that the left, it left the playing field wide open for the play of opinions, radical views, and political influence, which it has. 
uh, there was an article um, in the New England Journal of Medicine which stated wearing a mask, quote, outside healthcare facilities offers little if any protection from infection and that the desire for widespread masking is a reflexive reaction to anxiety over the pandemic. Uh, there are many, many more of these studies out there published by the National Center for Biotechnology, the Influenza Journal, Oxford Clinical Infectious Diseases, and the Cambridge University Press, just to name a few. Um, implementing mandatory mask policies across a society of 300 million because it makes some people feel better is asinine. But it makes a boatload of sense if you understand its purpose and its usefulness to shift the American mindset. Uh, Flip-flop Fauci himself during his 60 Minutes interview dismissed masks as essentially useless. He stated, quote, there is no reason to be walking around wearing a mask. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel better. It might even block a droplet, but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think it is, and often there are unintended consequences. Uh, rules that imply that the danger is higher than it really is are worth fighting. It is unkind. It is causing measurable harm to keep people, especially our kids, in a constant state of fear and anxiety. Uh, it's also morally problematic to walk around treating everyone as maybe sick. Uh, basically encourages our kids to see other people as a potential threat and inhibits their ability to read social expressions of their peers and communicate properly. Children's smiles are contagious and they are beautiful and I for one would like to see more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Reese White. Hello, and then my Melissa name. White. Good evening. Hello, my name is Reese White. I'm 11 years old. I go to Creekside Middle School. Last year, I came home from school every day with a bad headache, super tired, and just not feeling like myself. I was in the clinic multiple times a week because my head hurt so bad. I realized a lot of people don't wash their mask and wear the same one every day. That's just disgusting and unsanitary. Kids are constantly touching their face, so bacteria builds up on their mask and they're bringing, breathing that in. If masks work so well, then why were so many people quarantined last year? Another problem is a lot of kids, including me, break out when I wear a mask for that long. That is so bad for your skin. I went into middle school saying to myself, this is going to be a great year with no uniform and no mask. You're just going to change that for us? If parents want their kids to wear a mask, then they should have that option. But it's not fair to the people that don't want a piece of cloth on their face all day long. Also, you expect people to learn and understand their teachers, but they have a mask on. This is what it sounds like. I'm trying to listen to my teacher and I hear this. I want to be able to see their face. Mask or a thin piece of cloth on your face doesn't even, that doesn't even provide protection. There has been many studies showing that masks are useless, so why are we continuing to be forced to wear them? We are working backwards here. When we started school three weeks ago, we were at the peak of the Delta variant. We were given the option to wear masks at that time. But now that the numbers are dropping, now you're entertaining the idea of students wearing masks again? As of last week, there were two pediatric patients, neither of which in critical condition, hospitalized. Thank you for my time. Please keep masks optional. Thank you very much, Ms. White. Uh, Melissa White and then Kayla Jennings. And after Ms. Jennings is Sierra Osborne. Hello, good, after good evening. Make sure you speak into the microphone. Hello. Hi, my name is Melissa White. I'm a New Smyrna Beach resident and a Florida native. I have a sixth grader at Creekside and a third grader in Gifted at Chisholm. I want to be clear, I would like mask optional. We sent our kids back to school on August 16th. The COVID peak in this area, according to Halifax Health, was around August 19th. Dr. Finkler, Chief Cl Clinical Officer of Advent Health, was quoted on August 26th saying, I do believe that we have not only plateaued, but I believe we had peaked, and we are looking at the beginning of what we believe to be the downward curve. We need to quit assuming that every positive case is a fatality. According to Florida Department of Health, children 0 to 14 make up only 1% of hospitalizations with a death rate of zero. Now that we have the data on COVID, let's talk masks. The Journal of American Medical Association did a clinical trial which showed children had six times the maximum CO2 exposure after only three minutes of wearing a cloth mask. WebMD says that can lead to delirium, paranoia, depression, confusion, headaches, nausea, and vision problems. The study concluded that, quote, the case for governments to mandate school children to wear masks is weak. 
MIT performed a study that concluded there is 90% penetration rate of coronavirus for all cotton masks and handkerchiefs, 50% penetration rate for surgical masks and non-woven, non-medical masks. BMJ study shows contamination of the upper respiratory tract by viruses and bacteria on the outside of medical face masks. It stated that most that a moist mask is a breeding ground for antibiotic resistant bacteria and fungi. The study showed that medical masks were only safe if they were changed out every few hours, meaning a family of four would use roughly 20 masks a day. My friend's daughter has sensory issues that prevents her from wearing certain socks or underwear and she can't even wear jeans. As you can imagine, masks are not an option for her. She was forced to be a hermit in her home for a year. She was ecstatic to start middle school and hang out with her friends. Imposing a mask mandate will send her and all children like her back into seclusion once again. My daughter called me from the nurse's office three to four times a week complaining of headaches. These are my children, not political pawns. Mr. Persis was quoted as saying, if your child had the vaccine and is exposed to COVID, the child would not need to be quarantined. I think it's a huge benefit and I hope parents know that. He also stated in the same interview, the number of students that we have to quarantine is really makes it so difficult for parents and teachers because it's very disruptive. We really want to have our children in school. So what about my young children who can't get the vaccine, who can't be left to fend for themselves? If masks work, then why will my kids still be quarantined? Also, Dr. Fritz, please apologize to the parents of Volusia County for calling us bad parents for having concerns about a vaccine that has no long-term data and the effectiveness of masks. May I remind all of you that you work for me and everyone else here. You do not have the right to make medical choices for my children. I do not. Thank you, Ms. White, uh, Ms. Kayla Jennings, and then Sierra Osborne. Before I get started with my speech, I would just like to say that I recognize several of you up here as a downtown business owner, seeing you guys go downtown with no mask, drinking wine with your friends with no mask is okay for you. And it's a little hypocritical that you guys can go downtown, enjoy yourselves with your friends, but our children have to wear masks and you're trying to force that. But let me get to my speech. Hello, my name is Kayla Jennings and I have lived in this town and county my entire life. I'm also a well-respected business owner, but most importantly, I'm a mother. My son goes to George Marks Elementary, and this, di this district is deciding to go in its own direction against the will of its voters and legislation here in Florida. It is law to take your children to school. It is not in the law about mandatory masks and vaccines, so that in itself is defining the law by definition. You are living in fear with no facts, just feelings, and last time I checked, feelings are not facts. But I do have some facts for you from the CDC. According to the CDC, children are more at risk of dying on the way to school in a car accident than COVID-19. But earlier tonight, we got told that a 19-year-old child, who is an adult, by the way, my, my heart goes out to the family, but that is an adult. So what you're saying is it's a 0% chance for a, son, or a child my son's age to die of COVID from our, our uh report that you guys stated earlier. And several accredited doctors have gone on record stating that making mask, that masking makes it harder for children and people to empathize with each other, which can have long lasting effects. But again, we don't care about facts or feelings. Isn't that right, Dr. Fritz? Dr. Fritz, I quote that you stated, if you do not max or vaccinate your children, then it's bad parenting. And I will continue to say that, but the law says it's their choice, end quote. Did you not say that? I think you did. I truly hope the Attorney General acts with criminal intent against the school district and you, Dr. Fritz, for breaking the law and trying to pass curriculum and standards without parent or voter input. We as parents have had enough of the mandates, panic reactions caused by feelings, not facts, and government overreaching regarding our children. Let me know if this sounds familiar to you. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States and the state of Florida. Well, tonight I brought the Constitution with me for each one of you to read to refresh your memory for what you swore to protect and defend and refresh your memory to remind you of the oath that we trusted to protect for you guys with our children. 
I pay you to teach my son math, science, and reading, not segregation, which is exactly what you're teaching him. Segregation, by definition, states the action or state of setting someone or something apart from other people and things, teaching your kids that people with masks are good people and people without them are bad. Last time I checked, I did not sleep with you to conceive my child, so I don't need y'all telling me how to raise him. And Dr. Fritz? Thank you. Your time is Thank limited. you, Ms. Yes. Jennings, Ms. Sierra Osborne. After Ms. Osborne is Kim Short. After Ms. Short is Beth Johnson. Good evening. Make sure you speak into the microphone. Hi, my name is Sierra Osborne from Port Orange, and I'm a proud mother of a sophomore at Mainland High School. Today, I'm here as a voice and an advocate for my daughter and the other children's voices who need to be heard. There is no evidence or facts to prove that masks work. It's quite the opposite, actually. Masks are a form of child abuse, and if you don't agree, I'd urge you to look up the definition of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Masks are unsanitary and are touched all day long, making them more likely to cause illness, as proven by a recent uh, study from the University of Florida. Masking is equal to fear-mongering. Our children deserve to be able to see smiles, laughter, social cues, and hear what is actually being taught. They deserve to be educated, not taught virtue signaling. My daughter is hearing impaired and masks has significantly decreased her ability to hear her teachers. Last I checked, we live in America, founded on faith in God, liberty, freedom, and justice for all. I am here for our children, not to help the school system get more money from the CARES Act from the federal government. Mr. Biden has no right to pressure our great state of Florida to try to override Governor DeSantis' decision for our Florida. We, as parents, should reserve the right to choose what we feel is best for our children. Our children need and deserve the social interaction with their peers and their teachers, not to be segregated to online school or virtual learning. We are clearly at a precipice of, as a nation right now, and every single time we allow the government to usurp our rights, we trample on the graves of the brave men and women who have fought to make our nation free, free from tyranny, free from dictatorship, free to choose how to navigate our own health choices. We must stand up and say something. We are dangerously close to negating absolutely everything this great nation was founded on, allowing fear and ignorance to dictate our everyday actions without good reason and certainly without good science. We have to ask ourselves, what's next? Mandatory vaccinations, quarantine camps, which is also in the CDC's website. Never in the history of the world has a society relinquished their rights and gotten them back. We need to choose what side of history we're going to stand on. We are frighteningly close to reliving the history of Nazi Germany, and need I remind you that that tyranny began with a virus, fear, and segregation of those deemed as a risk to their community. I'd like to remind everyone on the board, online, in this room, and standing outside, that it is we the people, not them the politicians, that have the power to choose, to vote, and certainly to mask or unmask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Osborne, um, Ms. Kim Short. Good evening. I just want to start with saying something positive to break it up for a second. It seems like our families are really happy to be back in school. Um, and I definitely think that part of it is the fact that we have an optional mask mandate or mask um, policy in place. Before uh, or during this, um, during this meeting, I actually reached out to John Guthrie, the Vice President of Corporate Communications, because it seemed to me that one of the big things that came out of the last meeting was that there's some fear about the hospitalizations in our area. And so just to let everybody know, we have 102 patients hospitalized today. That's down from 180 two weeks ago. They have one infant, not critical, and they've had a total of five children, also not critical. Uh, of the 102 patients that they have in the hospital today, 85% of them are not vaccinated. Now, I know everybody in this room and outside and everybody listening has their feelings on vaccinations. I'm not for mandating vaccinations, just to be clear. However, the data is very clear on how people are reacting to this virus when they go into the hospital. It's there. 
if we only had 15 patients in there right now, do I think everybody would be as concerned? I don't. If it's really about children, then why is it that every single year I've asked this board to put in some kind of a swim week to teach our children how to swim because of the number of drownings that we have? And we've never done that in our elementary schools or had an emergency meeting. So I'm trying to understand why it is that we have three educators on this board who don't understand what it's like to have a kid who sits there, and I'm so glad that little girl did it, with your mask like this, and you can't see your teacher's face. Because I have a senior in high school right now who is loving going to school, and he's 17 years old, and he's healthy as a horse, and he's fully vaccinated. So please explain to me, why does he have to wear a mask? Because I got parents even asking me that. You guys have a lot of questions to answer, and it really goes back to quarantining. Our children deserve to see their teacher's face. My mother and sister and I, two of the best educators I know, have had this conversation at length. Every educator I know when they sit with me have the same one that I respect. You've got 53%, only 53% that I'm aware of, of your administrators who think this should be mandatory. You don't have enough evidence to make this, guys. Thank you very much, Ms. Short. Ms. Beth Johnson, and then Jennifer um, Davenport, and then Phyllis Stauffenberg. Stauffenberg? Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Beth Johnson. I am the mother of a five-year-old that started kindergarten this year at George Marks Elementary in DeLand. I am very aware that you all have encountered some parents in the past year and a half or so who have not been afraid to speak their minds. Obviously, a whole new class of students have entered Volusia schools this year, and with them, a whole new group of parents. And we've been watching. We have seen you ignore and disrespect parents. We have seen you trample on your oaths to uphold the U.S. and Florida state constitutions. We've watched you completely disregard the Parental bill Rights Bill, giving parents the right to make medical decisions for their own children. These new parents are prepared to stand with the others to hold you accountable for the decisions you make. We will not beg or plead. We will not even ask. We simply require that you do your duties to uphold the law as legislated by the state of Florida. This meeting was called to discuss masking, but you don't need to hear any more science. You don't need to hear what happens to a mask when it's worn for hours on end, but you have and you will. I am willing to bet that you don't want to hear about liberties, rights, or freedoms. Ironically, that is exactly what this meeting is about. Honestly, I believe that some children should wear masks because of whatever underlying conditions might compromise them. After discussing with my son's pediatrician, my husband and I feel our son is not at high risk and doesn't need one. I guess making a medical decision for my child based on recommendations from his doctor makes me a bad parent. Fortunately, Dr. Fritz, I'm not concerned with your opinion. This is all about choice, parental choice, and your obligation to protect it for Volusia parents. Your power to dictate how this school district is run only goes so far. If you choose to continue to be derelict in your duties, you will be removed. A committee has already been formed. Petitions are already circulating. Be assured that should we fail to convince Governor DeSantis to remove you, we will campaign, fundraise, and back candidates who will beat you at the ballot box in 2022. I will be taking my son to school in the morning with no mask. If he is not allowed in his class, I will be withdrawing him from the public school system until this board can meet the expectations of the constituents you represent. I would encourage others to do the same. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Davenport, and then Phyllis Stauffenberg, and then Matthew Johnson. Good evening, my name is Jennifer from Port Orange and I'm a concerned mother to three boys under the age of eight that are all attending elementary school here in our Volusia County Schools. 
I come to you today having read countless research articles, and I come from a place of wanting what I believe is best for my children. Let me make it clear before I begin. I am not for mandating masks. There are two topics that I feel are most important to discuss, which are the effectiveness of masks, along with the undesirable side effects from everyday use of masks. If you are going to mandate masks, then you should consider the effectiveness of masks. Currently, cloth masks and gaiters are not recommended forms of masks that protect us from the COVID-19 virus. Our healthcare workers at our local hospitals have been prohibited from wearing cloth masks and gaiters as they do not protect against the virus. Scientifically, cloth masks do not work. The CDC says if you do wear a cloth mask, then you should also wear a tightly fitted surgical mask over the cloth mask to reduce your chances of getting the virus. A cloth mask should not be worn by itself. In addition, if the mask get, gets wet, it becomes completely ineffective because moisture attracts bacteria. Therefore, you should frequently change your mask to reduce the risk of moisture retention. The only cloth masks that are somewhat effective in protecting you are the three-layer masks with the filtration system and barrier. A surgical mask and an N95 mask are most effective. So my question to the school board now is, if you mandate masks, will you then be supplying pediatric masks that are distributed to each child daily and ensuring that cloth masks and gaiters are prohibited to be worn on campus? If this is going to be mandated by the school board, then it should be done effectively and with cost to the school system. Therefore, if the child's mask gets soiled or, soiled or wet, then teachers need to be replacing them throughout the day or else our efforts are not effective. This is what science is telling us. In addition, if cloth masks are not suitable for our healthcare workers, then, th then why are we considering them suitable for protecting our children? Next, I would like to discuss all of the undesirable side effects from the everyday use of masks. According to a study conducted by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, there are a number of different undesirable side effects caused by wearing masks. This includes a significant increase in heart rate, a decrease in oxygen saturation, an increase in skin temperature under the mask, difficulty breathing. In addition, the investiga investigators in these studies observed dizziness, listlessness, impaired thinking, and concentration problems, which were statistically significant when wearing masks. The researchers in this study also found that masks interfered with temperature regulation, impaired the field of vision, and hindered our nonverbal and verbal communication. The use of masks for several hours a day often cause further detectable adverse effects such as headaches, local acne, mask-associated skin irritation, itching, and sensation of heat and dampness and discomfort. In another study conducted by a lab at the University of Florida, a group of local- Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Phyllis Stauffenberg, and then uh, after- Ms. Phyllis, go ahead. Oh, I, I apologize, ma'am, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Uh, Matthew Johnson, and after Mr. Johnson is Robert Clinton. I apologize. My name is Phyllis Stauffenberg, and I reside in DeLand. Um, first of all, I would like to say to the little girl that was up here speaking, if we were allowed to clap, I think she deserved a standing ovation. She was amazing. I received this from my insurance company, Humana Medicare. It states, for not for medical use. It's unbelievable. My insurance company is Humana one of the biggest in the state of Florida. I can't say nationally, but I say Florida. Not for medical use. And then I understand through research that they say that the cloth masks have no value whatsoever. In essence, I believe that we should put our cards on the table. Let's put it out there. Our children are, be are being used as political ping pong balls, back and forth, back and forth. By your own words, you say your board is divided. It's divided by politics. I don't mind if you, I don't like it, but I know the control of gas goes up and down according to politics. Our lobbyists, are the biggest are the pharmaceuticals. We all know that. And okay, that's what you're gonna do. Don't use our children as political ping pong balls between each other so in order we can, we can do a power play between parties and politics. Uh, Mr. Cologne that turns around and says, grandmothers won't have their grandchildren come to their house if they have COVID, you're wrong. If my grandchildren had COVID, 
and their parents have to go to work or they're not quarantined or they wanted to be at my house, I'd have them in a heartbeat. And every grandmother here, I guarantee, would do the same. So that's incorrect. But you, sir, are a political pawn for Advent. Well, although you don't have any credentials for that. Um, Carl, you've always had a soft spot in my heart, Carl Persis. Uh, and I just think you're the cat's meow. I do. <laughs> but on this one, we're going we're gonna to split in the middle of the road. I do know this. I think you're wrong on the, the numbers. I don't use stats, as I've told you before, because you can juggle them any way you want, depending on what side of the fence you're on. But I had a special news report today, <laughs> just before I came here, as there usually is, depending on which station that you're on, stating that the COVID variance has gone dramatically down. It's down. And even had a speech from the mayor of Orlando, Jerry Demings. I'm not worried. I'm not going to go this political thing of whether it's Democrat, <coughs> Republican, Independent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I Thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Matt Johnson, and then Robert Clinton, and then Florence Beebe. Good evening, sir. My name is, my name is Matthew Johnson. I live in DeLand and I'm the father of a kindergartner at George Marks Elementary who will not abide by an illegal mandate. I'm not here to talk to you about science. I'm sure you've heard enough science to make your heads explode. I'm sure you've heard enough science that your minds were already made up when you called this meeting last week. I'm also sure that like the last time you voted for mask mandates, you know, the meeting where you had mothers thrown out on their faces. When you already knew you were going to mandate them then, regardless of how many parents came to speak against them. You plan on implementing them again, against the will of those you serve. You are elected to represent us, not your political party. I believe this because I've watched silently as you ran roughshod over your oaths of office for a year and a half over the people who elected you and forced your politics down the throats of our children. No, I'm not here to speak about the science. I'm here to speak to you about the oaths you swore to the US and the Florida State Constitution. As someone who has spent years studying both and have taken courses regarding this great constitutional republic, I'm aware, just the same as you are, that there are zero provisions in either document that allow you to make medical decisions for parents. Someone would argue, some, excuse me, would argue that the Jacobson versus Massachusetts Supreme Court opinion is law. But those who do fail to understand that an opinion is far from law. And are arguing solely based on political leaning and fear. In fact, over and over again, court opinions are challenged and overturned. No, as I stated before, I'm not here to talk to you about science. I'm here to talk to you about the fact that you have zero constitutional authority, regardless of how many people beg and plead to mandate a medical decision overriding the parents or the children. In fact, a mandate is not even a law. Per Florida House Bill 241, providing that there are lesser means of mitigation, which as Ms. Haynes has already described, were left to the wayside this year, we already know that there are. As such, I'm actually here to inform you that a committee has already been formed, that letters are drawn up, petitions are out there to be put up every single one of you who vote to mandate masks upon our children. These letters will go to the Commissioner of Education and to the Governor, demanding that you be removed from office. According to Article 4, Section 7 of the Florida State Constitution, thousands of parents, as we speak right now, are currently signing these petitions. And with that, as a bad parent, I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Robert Clinton, then Florence Beebe, and then Scott Hottenstein. Hi, I'm Robert Clinton from Edgewater. I wondered if y'all had noticed how ironic it was that most of the anti-mask people that came up here were wearing masks. Yeah, go figure. 
I heard one lady say it was illegal for y'all to mandate vaccines. When I sent my daughter to school, there were like six vaccines she had to get before she could go to school. So I don't think it's illegal or the heck, I've still got marks on my arm where I got mine. The young lady over here with the red hair, she mentioned the 17% of the time the kids wear a mask in school. I wasn't so concerned about them catching a disease at school and bringing it home to me. I'm concerned about them catching a disease out in the street that 63% of the time and spreading it through the school. That's why they wear a mask. A mask is to protect the people out around you. The studies show that the mask stops the spray from a cough or a sneeze from going out very far from the body. Without the mask, it can go out 12 feet. With a mask, it's 18 inches. So that protects y'all when I cough and sneeze. And anyone that objects to that can look it up. I want to tell you something funny. Those of you that know me up here, and the one or two of you do, sometimes you know I've got a weird sense of humor. When I was growing up between Edgewater and Oak Hill, I was the oldest of five kids. And we pretty much lived out in the woods on the intercoastal waterway. Until I went to school, I'd never worn a pair of shoes, but they were mandated by the school board. I rarely around the house wore much more than underwear. That was my bathing suit for the intercoastal. The school said I couldn't do that. And I bet most of the people behind me are glad that I put on my clothes and shoes today. And I'll yield to this man. Thank you very much, Mr. Clinton. Uh, Florence Beebe, and then Scotty Hottenstein, and then Sharon Levine. Good evening. Florence Beebe, Eagle Land, Florida. I just would like to say that when the right of freedom, quotation, encroaches on the health and safety of the community, the right ceases. It should not take children, more children, teachers, or staff to become seriously ill to persuade you to mandate the mask to defeat this deadly disease. It's a community effort. You speak into the microphone. It's a community effort Thank you. to control this deadly virus. And I think that it's responsible to participate in this small way to decrease the spread of this disease. Also, I want to remind you that a majority vote of three school board members would ensure a much safer environment for all. Have courage. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, did I pronounce your name incorrectly? Uh, good, good evening, ma'am. I'm uh, Scott Hoddenstein. I'm the Thank president you. of the uh, Democratic Public Education Caucus of Florida. And uh, I live in Hillsborough County. Thank you for having me tonight. Our students need to be in school with their teachers and their support systems, both for their education and for their mental health. And because of that, I urge you to take all mitigation measures against COVID and quarantines, including vaccinations for those 12 and up, masks, especially for those who are not old enough to be vaccinated. I'm a 24 year Navy vet and after I retired, I became a middle school civics teacher. We teach a bunch of different benchmarks in seventh grade civics. Benchmark 1.4 is about the social contract where individuals give up rights to protect the common good. Benchmark 2.2 about citizenship is how citizens have responsibilities that go along with their rights. We stop at red lights. We serve on juries. We defend our country when called on by the draft. In benchmark 2.4, when we talk about rights, we say that we have rights, but some rights may be limited. You have dress code. We're not allowed to cuss at a school board meeting. Article 9, Section 4B gives you, the school board, constitutional authority to operate, control, and supervise the schools in your district. 
the Parental Bill of Rights codified in Florida Statute 1014.03 says that you can infringe on parental rights if reasonable and necessary for a compelling state interest. Keeping kids in school is a compelling state interest. I tried to do some research to see your quarantine numbers, about 13, 1400. Are those students learning? Are they going hungry? You normally feed breakfast and lunch to a bunch of free and reduced lunch students. How is their mental health when they're not at school with their friends and their support systems, their teachers, their school counselors, student services staff? Please, let's do everything we can to keep students in school which includes implementing a mandatory mask mandate so that we could get past the quarantines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your service. Um, Sharon Levine, and then uh, Michael, and I'm gonna mispronounce it, I apologize. Kosis? Okay, and, and then Janet uh, Potsik. Hi. Good I'm evening. Sharon. Speak into the microphone. Okay. Hi, I'm Sharon uh, here in Deland, mom of a fifth grader. Based on recent Florida Department of Health weekly reports, one quarter to one third of COVID cases have been pediatric. Pediatric deaths held at seven until this this August, our month right now, were near where they nearly doubled to twelve in the course of a month. The Delta variant pulled the rug out from everyone's feet. This is no longer a pandemic of older folks. It's now a pandemic of unvaccinated people, and our children are currently involuntary members of the unvaccinated group. Our children are currently sharing public space in the public schools that they attend, the schools that were a safer haven from COVID last year due to layered mitigation strategies. Board members, you have been entrusted with ensuring these public places are a safe and healthy place to learn. You swore an oath to the state constitution to do so. Now the Parents' Bill of Rights has been affirmed as allowing school districts to take action which is reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest and in that such action is narrowly tailored and is not otherwise served by a less restrictive means. It's clear that current local conditions caused by the COVID Delta variant merit an action on your part to reduce the risk of harm to the students of Volusia County Public Schools, as well as to reduce learning disruptions from increasing quarantines. I believe a universal mask mandate narrowly tailored to be in effect for a finite duration or tied to specific local public health conditions such as positivity rate would be the most reasonable and least restrictive action the board could take. The CDC and Florida DOH recommend a layered mitigation approach, particularly for children who cannot be vaccinated. Based on the Volusia County Schools COVID-19 health and safety protocols, um, the prevention measures of limited class size, co cohorting and social distancing have not been sufficiently implemented. And I assume that sentinel testing is off the table due to cost and its invasive nature. Also, plexiglass and Clorox wipes are not sufficient for an airborne pathogen. That leaves universal masking as the least restrictive mitigation measure, especially for the population too young to be vaccinated. As I'm sure you found in your research of credible sources, universal masking is safe, effective, and minimally invasive. A medical opt-out would serve the needs of those for whom masking isn't medically safe. Course enforcement will always be a challenge as it is for all district-wide rules. However, the possibility of imperfect implementation does not imply there should be no attempt made to utilize the one effective measure that's feasible right now. A safe classroom is one where a child isn't mandated to take their chances with COVID roulette and the long-term impairments it could pose. A safe classroom is one where all children, even those more vulnerable to COVID, are entitled to their seat in a public classroom and not made to feel like a burden. If we want to participate in public schools, we have to participate in public health. Please institute a temporary universal mask mandate tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Michael, I'm not gonna disrespect you by mispronouncing your last name. Did I did it right? Oh, oh gosh, that's great. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And then after Mr. Kosis, right? Uh, Janet Postick, and then Anna Hannon. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, first of all, um, I wanna thank you for allowing me a few minutes to speak to you tonight. Um, I want to thank you, the educators on the board, for your service to education. Um, and I want to thank the amazing parents here tonight 
for all your, your words um, and your, your research. Uh, I am an educator. I am a elementary school educator in Volusia County. I used to work right here in DeLand at an elementary school, and now I am in Port Orange. I love my job. I absolutely love my children. This is my third career, and it's the best career I've had, although I've made lots more money elsewhere. But <laughs> with that being said, I could rehash all the stats and statistics that we've all heard already, and that won't really do any good because we all have, we're all on one side of the fence or the other. But I'm going to give you the truth on the ground. I know you guys were in the classroom for lots of years, but I, I ask, are you in the classroom now and get to see what I see and get to hear what I hear and see the harassment and see the, 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 the hurt with these children because, not, not in spite of, but because of these masks. These masks are not effective. We know this by science, but if you think they are, that's fine. But I'll tell you a couple stories that will kind of blow your mind. So, you know, first of all, they, they don't wear them right. Nobody wears them right. The teachers don't, the administrators, the administrators don't. That's just a fact. They just don't wear them right. Nose is out and so forth. Um, they're constantly being dropped on the ground. Children are stepping on them. They're putting them back on their face. Um, they're drinking their water bottle through them. I mean, these are kindergarten. These are five-year-olds through 10, 11-year-olds. They're not going to do it right. And so what ends up happening is they just are becoming bacteria traps for all kinds of other problems. All right, and I see it daily. I'll give you two instances today. A first grader who um, is running around the track, and of course I don't make I, I make sure they don't have them on when they're outside. And he has it on a lanyard, and he's running. And I say, "Hey, there you go, Peter. Good job, buddy. All right." And he goes, "I go, oh, you got to sneeze." He goes, grabs his mask and shoop, sneezes into the mask, and then puts it on. I'm like, Peter, no, no, no. And so now I go and I try to give him another mask. I'll think it's absolutely insane. But then let's go a step further with Lexi. Beautiful, sweet girl. I let her out of her car this morning with mom, and she has her mask. And I don't wear one. I don't have to. I have a medical reason for that, and I don't need to go into it. However, I'm there and open it. Mom smiles at me. She's happy. I say, oh, wow, neat little mask. You have flowers all over it. Well, later in the day, I see another girl wearing the same mask. And I said, Jordan, wow, you got a mask just like Lexi. She says, no, this is Lexi's mask. We decided to change. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> uh, Janet Postick. Yes. And then after Janet is Anna Hannon. And then um, Adam Swari. Good. Yes, Hello, my name is ahead. Janet Potzik, and I am reading this message on behalf of an anonymous Volusia County Schools employee to the school board of Volusia County. I cannot appear at this meeting tonight in objection to a mask mandate for children in public school for fear of losing my job. I am also speaking for many, many other Volusia County School employees who cannot speak up for fear of retribution from their superiors and from you, the school board. My first question to you is, what is the school board's function? to set up and maintain schools, personnel, and leadership for the education of children. My tax money goes to your salaries and the salaries of the employees. You work for us, so I ask respectfully that you consider what I'm saying. I would like to ask how many of you in the last year have spent a whole seven to eight hour day in a public elementary, middle, or high school? If you have, have you done it while wearing a mask? Have you walked every hallway all day in the heat? Have you worked the parking lot at arrival and dismissal? Have you thought of being in the shoes of a teacher, receptionist, or registrar all day? How about trying to serve food in the cafeteria while not being able to breathe? You have no idea how it feels to sit and be muzzled up to seven hours per day while trying to convey lessons, words, and discipline to students, especially in an elementary school setting like the one I work in. I would venture to say that none of you have experienced this firsthand, so I urge you to consider what those of us who have have to say. Even more importantly, my school houses EBD students, ESE, and pre-K multi-students who absolutely need to see their teachers' faces and follow their voice for learning to take place. 
Not only are the adults now forced to muzzle their faces and restrict their breathing, but you are trying to push the same horrible experience once again on the children who are there for the very purpose of learning. Your role as a school board is to make sure learning takes place. After the past year being forced to cover up, I can tell you from firsthand experience that the children in my school showed, showed marked sadness, a very low grasp of learning, and lack of socialization. These kids experienced continuous scolding about pulling up an oversized mask that had slipped below their nose while they were singing a song in kindergarten, reciting a poem, or generally answering questions. And how about music? The music teacher has such a challenge to even do her job. The kids cannot be heard if they're singing or answering questions. They felt such shame in not keeping their mask on at recess in PE in the blistering heat of Florida where they should be able to run and breathe freely. All of this is not conducive to learning and growing and grasping the concepts of the grade they're trying to complete. Another important point that I want to make is that the choice to mask or not is for the parents of each child to make. After all, this is America where we have basic human rights. We are guaranteed life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ms. Anna Hannon, and then Adam Swarry, and then Tiara Dipas, Dipas oh, I can't say, Dipas, it's like I can't say cinnamon, cinnamon either. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. First of all, we have Anna, then Adam, and then Tiara. Good evening. Good evening. Um, back in April and May, I was here with you all, and we were talking about the Parents' Bill of Rights. Um, it got passed in the last session, HB 241, and it seemed like we all agreed that it was going to be time to turn to mass optional, and that was also one of the reasons, parents uh, having a right to make medical decisions. I never really saw an indication from you all that you all thought it was a bad law, um, so I'm kind of surprised that I'm seeing that you all might think it is now. Um, since the uh, trial verdict on Friday, Commissioner Corcoran, he is still proceeding. Um, he sent out eight letters to school boards uh, on Friday afternoon. Um, yesterday he had a press conference and he announced that <clears throat> for Alachua and, and Broward um, that he was still going to be suspending and deducting the salaries uh, from the funding. Um, so it, this seems like it's going to continue on until, um, you know, there's a, a court of appeals. Um, also for Alachua, the commissioner said that, um, that uh, he, they have to send a report of student disciplinary action, action to the commissioner. Um, I watched the hearing of the Alachua and, and Broward uh, school district mass mandates and um, the chairman of the State Board of Education, Tom Grady, he really drilled those superintendents. I mean, it was brutal. He was, he's an attorney, and it, this is a law. I mean, you all might uh, disagree with being dictated to with the um, executive order. I mean, we didn't like being dictated to either. I, I, I can see that, but it is a law. And why? Why would you all want to put Dr. Fritz in that same position that Carly Simon was put in? Uh, don't do that to him. Unless he, I mean, I don't know, Dr. Fritz, why you would ever want to be in that position. That was hard to listen to. I, I was one of the speakers, and a couple of us were from Volusia. Um, I, I just, I don't want y'all to, to go in that direction, obviously. Um, you know, this, this is a historical time, and uh, I don't think that masking children and taking away parents' rights is what you want to be as part of your legacy. Um, you know, I offered this week many solutions. I think, you know, we're not going to agree on, on masks, but parents still need to be able to have the rights to choose. I think we need to take our focus off of combating each other with this mask issue and start looking into air purification, something that is non-invasive to the child. Um, I don't think that we have done due diligence on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hannon. Um, Mr. Adam Swarry, then Tierra, and then Josh Hardy. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hello, my, my name is Adam Sarwi in Port Orange, Florida. 
I'm a firefighter paramedic and a father of two children, one at Horizon and one at Silver Sands. Today I want to talk to you briefly about communication. I've made the following statement time and time again over the course of my adult life that everything rises and falls on communication. Poor communication breeds confusion and bitterness, and effective communication leads to understanding and confidence. Any given response to any given communication can stem from what was actually communicated or merely perceived. And so I want to shed some light on a few things that have been communicated both from, in, from both directions, from the school board to the parents and the parents to the school board. As far as I can tell from my own anecdotal evidence, the majority of people and parents that have made a presence at recent school board meetings have expressed disapproval in any masking mandate. At the least, the people that we hear every time the doors open are outside waving signs. They're not calling for a mask mandate. And I do say masking mandate, not masking in general. The problem is and has always been the obligation to the point of repercussion. Parents have been communicating to you their desire for the freedom to choose whether or not their child is masked in the public school setting. The second thing, given the volatile climate of the pandemic and masking and the response from Volusia County Schools, I can tell you that more than a nominal number of families will be opting out of Volusia County School System if a mask mandate is enacted. And please understand this is not some sort of low-level threat or strong-arming, but again, this is the parents communicating something to the school board and that I don't believe you should take lightly. Now to shine a light on something that has been communicated from the school board to the parents. Superintendent Prince, you recently said, and I quote, Mike Rego stood in front of everybody and said, get vaccinated, take responsibility for your kids, put a face mask on, no different than your superintendent, and I'll continue to say it, I think it is bad parenting when people don't do it. Now that is, that's communication. That statement is, at the least, wildly unprofessional, if not openly hostile and inflammatory. The implication of that statement is that the overwhelming majority of parents of Volusia County schools, if you've been allowed in a school, if you've been to school and you've seen how many students are not wearing masks, and you know what I mean, that since they are parenting badly, they do not know how to properly care for their children, and so then the county will need to step in and care for the kids instead. That is what is being communicated, in no uncertain terms. And look, we all want what is best for our kids, and I think that's common ground that we can all find. What is best for the kids has to be determined by the individual parent. There, there is genuine abuse out there where a parent may need to be removed from the decision-making process. And choosing to let your child breathe freely without a mask is not one of them. I implore you to allow the masking policy to remain how it is at this moment, an option. Hear us communicating this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And Tiara, that's you? Okay, thank you for coming, and I apologize for mis mispronouncing your last name. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead and speak into the microphone, please. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Tiara, and I'm here to speak to you about, as a seventh grade student, about masks, about the mask, <laughs> about possibly putting on a mask mandate. Last year, at gym, we had assigned seats and strict rules on masks. We were socially distancing, doing workout videos in our designated area. On most days, kids would constantly be told to pull up their masks at gym. I would pull mine down too, because I couldn't breathe. Now in gym, we, are, we can sit wherever we want and have our masks down. On top of that, we are allowed to play volleyball, four square, nine square, and basketball at gym with our masks off. On September 4th, 2020, Volusia County had an electrical issue affecting the school's air conditioning. It was so hot. The air was off for a few classes. Teachers had no plan on what to do. My teachers called the office to see if our masks could come down, and the office said no. Changing classes in the indoor hallways was even hotter. We could hear shoes squeaking in the hallways and saw water on the floor from the humidity. My sister took a video of how bad it was. I was sweating so bad that in fourth period, I had to change my mask from, from home to a disposable school mask. Mine was soaked in sweat. Where are the emergency plans on mask reg regulations? But now, this year is so different from last year. Now I don't have to wear a mask. I'm at the age now to where if I feel the need to wear a mask, I will put one on. This year has been way more enjoyable than last year. 
I have been more social and have made tons of new friends. My acne is starting to clear up and also getting better grades. I'm a seventh grade student taking algebra and getting quarantined is not an option. Last year I took sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math and it was hard to keep to do it in a mask. My, I typically am an honor roll student with A's and B's, but last year I was a C average student. When I say I didn't like it, I mean it. So why do kids with a 99.7% survival rate without a vaccine need to wear a mask? So, Dr. Fritz, I'm not being raised by a bad parent because I know they care about my physical and mental health. They are not bad parents. Thank you very much, ma'am. Josh Hardy, and then Jason Turner, and then after Mr. Turner is Sid Sydney Smith. Didn't we have Sydney Smith before? Okay. Uh, and then if, is there a Sydney Smith? Didn't we do Sydney Smith earlier? Um, I know we had another Sydney. Let me look. Sydney Smith, yes. Okay. If if I'm mistaken, uh, and she's still here, we'll we'll continue. But after uh, Josh, then Jason, and then Ray Sanchez. I apologize, sir, for taking your time. Good evening, folks. My name is Josh Hardy. I'm a father of three from Orange City, Florida. I agree with you, Miss Cutbert. The world is split in two, and so many, so much right now. That said, covering up people's faces will never bring people together. Your terrible and broken contact tracing protocols may ha that make absolutely no sense and have worked in, have not, haven't worked in, I'm sorry folks, no sense and haven't worked the problem. If you, Mark Rubio, have a problem with the contact tracing policy, change the policy. Don't implement a new policy to fix another one. That's a band-aid. Change the original policy if you have a problem with the contact tracing policy. How dare you, Fritz, our superintendent, call us bad parents. And I cannot believe that none of the school board have come out publicly and called him out for his comment either. He has no right as a superintendent of this district to call us bad parents. You are not an elected official. We did not vote for you. You have no rights to call us anything but your constituents. The board is solely responsible for putting this man here and none of you spoke out against his comment. So do you all agree with it? Do you all agree that we're bad parents if we don't put masks on our children? It's pretty sad. COVID peaked in January, folks. The Delta just finished. Deaths are dropping. Delta was never as deadly. We are at 90% less deaths nationwide than we were at the peak of COVID in January. Thousand beds have opened up. Cases are going down. The summer season is subsiding as we speak here tonight while you wish to bring back masks. What's the angle? So the government can make it look like mask mandates helped an already flattening curve? Convenient. There have been seven, that's a total of seven COVID deaths among children 16 and under in the state of Florida in the last 18 months. Not a single one of them were in Volusia County. Not a single one. And we're here talking about masks for something that has not actually affected a death of this county. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, 99.97% to 100% of all childhood COVID cases survive. Children have a 0.000532 chance of actually first catching COVID, then sadly losing their battle with it. That's right, that's three zeros after the decimal point. Pneumonia deaths in our children are up by 440% since 2015. Studies show masks can cause bacterial pneumonia. So who are you folks to say that that 440% increase from 2015 is not contributed to the mask that you're asking our children to wear? Not forcing our children to wear. Uh, there is no laws that mandate anything and recommendations to be given, but people recommend. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Jason Turner. Good evening, make sure you speak into Good evening, the microphone. Guys. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I think we live in an age where personal opinion is paramount. I mean, I'm supposed to sit here and tell you that I'm right, you're wrong. I've done all this research. And you're supposed to listen to me and do what I tell you. And You know, you, you, you've earned your spot on this board and, and 
you deserve the right to, to vote and, and act on this board. Where I start to get paused with that is when my personal rights and when the rights of my children are impacted by those, those decisions that you make. And we're all different. We're all gonna have our own opinions. And who am I to tell you you're right? Who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? At the end of the day, those differences are what makes us great. Those differences are what makes us America. What makes us different than, than all these other countries that everybody wants to come here? And truly, if you look at this situation, it's the children that are gonna be impacted the most by this because you know, I go out in public and I go to these places where lots of people are gathered and by and large, the majority of the people aren't wearing masks. So that tells me that that they're not as fearful of this virus as, as what's being claimed. And now these, these kids are gonna come to school and we're supposed to teach our kids that, that our leaders are, are their authority and they're supposed to be respectful of that. And so it, I'm somewhat confused at why I'm supposed to listen to you guys and why I'm supposed to submit to your authority when you refuse to submit to the, the authority of our governor. He, I mean, he was elected by half of our population here in the state of Florida, oh, greater than half. And history will tell whether the right decision is made tonight. Uh, and you guys, I don't know, but I am concerned. I'm, I'm concerned about the future of our country. We're supposed to be, I mean, we're 16 months into the science experiment, guys. And, and sadly, I don't think we're any closer to the end than when we started. And I'm looking forward to next year, and I'm wondering, I'm, I'm pretty confident that mandate, no mandate, mask, no mask, we're gonna be sitting right here again. So I got a kid at home, and he was quarantined last year, and he was quarantined this year, and he missed two weeks of school, and he hasn't had one COVID symptom yet. It's scary, guys. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Ray Sanchez, then Barb LeBlanc. LeBlanc. Barb LeBlanc is after Mr. Sanchez, and then Stephanie Galliano Zaluka. Good evening, and thank you. Ray Sanchez, Ormond Beach, Florida. Politics and science, here we are. Scientists don't have any of the answers, and I guess politicians have all the answers. They feel like they can control people and control a virus, which uh, doesn't make any sense. So here's what I have to say. Follow the law. A Leon County judge's decision is not the law of the land. Courts do not make law. Legislator, legislative bodies do. Courts do, do not issue rulings. I keep hearing the word rulings. They're not rulings. They render decisions and opinions on individual cases. You're siding with one court's opinion and ignoring another's, namely the Green versus Alachua appellate decision. So by having this meeting, you're obviously making a political statement and being lawless. You are willfully ignoring state law, which is HB 241. Science on the matter has been all over the map. Immunologists, virologists, bi microbiologists, and infectious disease experts, they disagree. The only consistency has been the inconsistency. From one study to another, there is lack of verifiable data due to misleading or even suppressed information. If you vote based on that, you are making a despotic political statement, not a scientific one. Stop making these decisions based on politics. Stop making these decisions, period. Get back to your place and purpose. Let the parents make their own informed decisions on this matter. You don't get to make medical decisions for parents. Leave the choice to whom it belongs, parents. Remember where the power resides. The power resides in the people, our parents, and the taxpayers, not you. Your power is delegated one. You have no delegated authority for medical decisions for the parents and their children. Obstructing oxygen flow is a medical decision, and that decision belongs to the parents, not you. There is no emergency or exigent circumstance here. You are stepping outside of your legal and delegated authority. 
Mandating masks for the children rather than making them optional would also block access to education for many children. You would be discriminating against many in the community. Allowing adequate provisions for the education of our children is a state constitutional matter of which you would be in violation. James Madison said, our conscience is our most valuable property. You will be violating the rights of parents, the parental bill of rights, the law, and imposing your own political ideas onto the consciences of all parents and, and school children. Violating personally held beliefs and conscience is a direct attack on one of the most sacred fundamental rights. It is a direct assault on liberty. May God have mercy on you. As for me, I believe you deserve punishment for your malfeasance. You have a pattern of violating law, imposing arbitrary and plenary dictates, and abusing your authority. You should be arrested, or at least the very least, resign. There may be legal repercussions if you don't uh, take this, uh, the, you know, follow this mandate and take it away. Thank you very much, okay. Mr. Sanchez. Um, Barbara Blanc, and then Stephanie Galliano Zaluca. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Barb LeBlanc from Ormond Beach. In March 2020, we were asked to mask up for two weeks to help slow the wave of COVID. I asked you, school board members, where has this gotten us 18 months later? Most of our beautiful children are born with awesome immune systems and are super resilient. These last 18 months have forced our children to wear masks that are gross, dirty, and infested with all kinds of germs by the end of their school day. Why is it okay for a person to cause division against another person who chooses not to mask up? The person causing this division has chosen to wear a mask, yet won't afford the other person to have the freedom to choose not to wear one. What, may I ask, is this other than discrimination? The children and their parents should be allowed freedom to make their choice. Personally, I expect the opportunity to make a choice and have it respected, and for you to be able to choose. Respectfully, if I were sneezing, running a fever, coughing, I would stay home, as I have done for much of my 58 years. For all our lives, we have gone out and did as we wished each day, maskless, I might add. All our years, if one was feeling sick, one stayed home. If someone is sick or afraid of getting sick, then he or she should stay home until they have recovered from their sickness or have stopped being afraid. I have prayed about this. God has not directed me to mask up or vaccinate. In fact, a few months ago, and presently, all I keep hearing from him is ye of little faith, regarding people lining up like sheep for the vaccine and walking around like zombies wearing a mask glued to their faces. You see this all the time. Just look on the street with someone walking in fresh air and nobody within 100 yards of them wearing a mask, or the person in a car with no other occupants wearing a mask or two. Crazy, but we have all witnessed it. Two years ago, you would have thought that person lost it. Our world leaders have instilled such fear in the people. We need to stop looking at man, the government, or the school for all our answers. You don't have the right to pass something that is illegal. If you vote in favor of this, you are breaking the law. Families should not be forced to do something they do not believe in. COVID has caused much division, strife, and hatred. We will hope for much healing in the years ahead. Please quit restricting our freedoms, taking around our, away the rights of our children, and micromanaging yet, yet again in the classroom from your seats into land. If we are indeed created in God's image, we would not be marrying, wearing masks for 18 months. Have you seen pictures of Jesus or whomever is your God wearing a mask? This is pure government overreach. Let the people choose. Remember, one day, each one of us will need to answer. Thank you, God bless, and have a great evening. Thank you very much, ma'am. Stephanie Galliano, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, Ms. G, you have the microphone. And then Elizabeth, Elizabeth Albert is after that one. And we still have, uh, pardon me, ma'am, we still have 15 minutes. Do we have more? Um, we have more? We have nine minutes and 50 seconds. May I have a couple more, please? The top couple? Thank you. I apologize. You go right ahead. So um, 
I don't want to be here tonight. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be talking to anybody. I, I want to be at home. I want to be with my kids. I want to be getting them ready for school tomorrow, getting them tucked in, bath time, bedtime stories. And yet I feel compelled to be here and to speak on behalf of all the parents that you hear out there. Rational parents, rational parents like me, understand this emergency meeting is likely an unfortunate formality for you to place your rubber stamp on moral support superiority on public record and then attempt to unlawfully command power and control over the people. Unlike most of the parents gathered in this room, I don't identify as a pro or anti-masker nor a pro or anti-vaxxer. Rather, I identify as a concerned parent who is troubled by the arrogant disregard for lawful parental choice, the appalling abandonment of leadership, and the disturbing precedent of overreach. Make no mistake, for parents like me, this is far less about a rinky-dinky, ineffective, store-bought mask and more about what it represents, because I too believe that this is politically motivated. This is about power and this is about control, and it has to stop. Where's the line? You keep moving the goalpost. What about those of us who have antibodies? Are there excuses made for us? Those of us who have gotten through this? I mean, what else can it be about? There have been no, numerous sightings here tonight about the science, about the science. Yet here we are leaning on the science behind your decisions. The pilot programs are showing no statistical difference. You know, there was a CDC in Georgia that showed no statistical difference. And here we are playing with kids, you know, playing with their mental health, playing with their physical health. Here we are. To be clear, health decisions are both highly personal and lawfully protected as the right and responsibility in this, personal, in this particular case of the parents and legal guardians of the children in question. Sadly, you've allowed your personal opinions to cloud a genuine calling to serve clearly impacting your ability to bestow fairness and impartiality to the elected positions which you hold. That's not leadership. You have the audacity to both privately and publicly demean us, ridicule, and try to silence anyone who stands in the way of what I consider to be a power grab. That's not leadership. Leadership is this room full of people and all the parents outside, whether we agree or disagree, here fighting for our voices to be heard. People like me, parents like me, we have no interest in demanding that parents who feel differently than us unmask their kids. No, we're telling you that you don't get to choose to suppress the parental rights of some in order to appease others. It doesn't work that way, and we demand better. If you don't have a genuine leading to call, then move over, because there's a whole bunch of us out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Albert, and then Meredith Ashley. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Well, Albert. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Fritz, members of the audience. It's a hard night tonight. I've spent a lot of nights with you in this boardroom, and this is one of the toughest I've seen in a long, long time. Um, so I want to talk to you from a little bit different perspective. I want to talk to you about what's going on in our schools right now. We know that we have a substantial amount of folks who are quarantined, adults and students. We know uh, when those students go out, it creates a hardship on everyone. And so as we struggle through this moment, I'm asking you to also consider what's happening in your, your schools. Your teachers are working hard to keep up. They're trying to serve the students that are still in their classrooms while sending work home through a variety of mechanisms to try to continue the educational uh, outcomes for our students. And, and they're struggling. We have teachers who are experiencing almost a third of their students who are being quarantined. We have schools where hundreds of kids are going out, you know this. I'm repeating what you already know. We have support staff who can't serve the students that they've been hired to serve because they're subbing in classrooms when teachers go out. We have office specialists who are doing 
uh, work in the clinic because the nurse is helping to quarantine children. We have administrators who can't get to classrooms to see what's going on because they are working to help quarantine folks as well. Something's got to give. Uh, we can't continue this way. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Uh, I can't tell you what the solution is. You have to make that decision. So I'll just simply say this to you. Be strong, be courageous, and do what you know is right for the teachers, the staff, and the students of our Volusia County Schools. It's gonna be a hard decision, and whatever you decide is gonna make somebody angry, but it, you're gonna to have to choose. And so again, I'll encourage you to just think about what's going on in our schools and make the right choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albert. And last is Meredith Ashley. No, Ms. Ashley? Then uh, Ellington Kellogg? Are you Meredith? Are you Meredith? Or are you Ellington? Yes. Okay, have a seat, please. You'll, you'll be our last speaker. And speak into the microphone. Tell us your name. My and name is Ellington Cobb. Nice to meet you. And tell us where you're from. Dawn. Okay, thank you. You have your three minutes. I'll give you a couple extra seconds. I took it up for you. Go ahead. I'm Ellington Cobb, a sixth grader at Dawn Middle School. I think that there should be a mask mandate. I think this because I was not super comfortable coming back to school, but I expected more people to wear a mask. The lack of people wearing a mask makes me less comfortable being in a classroom. The average number of people wearing an, a mask in my class is about 27%. At my school, oh, more than 20% of the students are quarantined. Two of my friends have already been quarantined. In my classes, a lot of people are not wearing masks. Even though a lot of people not wearing masks are fine right now, eventually they will be more likely to be quarantined. Children my age cannot get vaccinated. The COVID cases are getting worse and students should be protected in school. Students who are not wearing masks are quarantined for longer. I think everyone should have a safe environment in school. Okay. Thank you. You're all finished? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming tonight and we hope you stay well. Thank you. How are we on time, Ms. Schultz? I have one more minute. Okay, we'll do, can we do one with one minute? Riley Kellogg. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, Riley Kellogg, can you do it very quickly? Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Riley Kellogg. I'm a student at DeLand High School. First of all, I would like to say thank you for holding this meeting. I strongly support that everyone wearing a mask. I'm really happy to be back at school, but at the same time, I feel like it would be a lot safer if everyone was masked. My friends and I are all people who wear masks. In a normal year, I might be talking to other people in my class and making new friends. This year, on the other hand, I don't feel comfortable spending time with people who don't mask or don't take the pandemic seriously. That being said, a mask mandate will, keep, will help keep everyone safer. Masks help keep the aerosol droplets that make people sick out of the air, helping to reduce the spread of COVID. That will help in decreasing the number of students in quarantine. Students are less likely to have a harder time learning from home um, off of a computer than they will while in a classroom talking to a teacher and receiving actual instructions. Students, teachers, and staff have the right to a safe and healthy work and learning environment. I understand that it might be hard to enforce, but the benefits would outweigh the issues with a mask mandate by far. Okay, I, I have to cut you off because our two hour limit. We did get both of your messages. Thank you so very much. We wish you good health. Thank you. Thank you. We are now concluding our public participation. We will take a 10 minute break. We'll be back.
Welcome back to our meeting. Uh, thank you. We, I think we all needed a little um, bathroom break, so thank you. Um, we are back. We finished our uh, public participation. We've heard from our experts. Is there a motion? I'd actually like to ask a few questions. Well, can, um, can we get can we get a, a motion okay, on the yes, floor? Yes, we, we can will have discuss? a motion, a second motion, that we go to discussions. Absolutely. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I would move that we uh, uh, put in place a a temporary mandatory uh, mask uh, policy that would start uh, the day after Labor Day and that uh, would go through the end of October, ending October 31st. Um, having said that, that would mean that uh, at each school board meeting, you know, through that period, that we would get updates about how this was uh, trending in our, in our schools, uh, COVID as well as quarantines. I'm um, as, uh, uh, well, I, I don't wanna talk. I wanna just make the motion and we'll see if there's a second and then we we'll, can go forward from there. I'm sorry, but we need to continue with our meeting. Please let us finish. Thank you. Um, the motion has been made by Mr. Carl Persis to have an emergency adoption of policy 503, um, a mandatory face covering from what I guess it would, what is Tuesday, um, the 7th or is it the 6th? Yeah, Madam Chair, September. I say that, I say starting that, it, it, it gives uh, parents uh, plenty of time to know to learn about what the board uh, if the board chooses to go that route gives them time to prepare okay. and, and excuse and me all sir of those, please all of those things please um, what day is that what date is that uh, Tuesday the date is that the 6th is, uh, Tuesday is September the 7th September 7th, 7th. September 7th. September okay 7th. I want to make sure the dates are there from September 7th 21 yes. through October 31st is that what you're suggesting? That's what that, I That's your recommendation. Su right. Suggesting, I understand that this could go for as long as 90 days, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that length of time. I think that's around uh, 40 days or so, 45. Uh, well, there's 31 in October plus almost all of September, so it's almost 60 days. So 30 and 21, yeah, 51 days, I guess. Okay, with, with updates on, on um, our numbers e with each meeting, okay. Frequently, Is, yes. Okay. It, yes, yes. All right. It's, it's not, <laughs> again, I, I don't want to speak for, I would like to speak for it after I know okay. the second. Okay, could you restate your motion then with the um, face covering and the policy and the date? Yeah, the, uh, the motion is then to, uh, start a uh, mandatory facial covering, I'll call it a facial covering policy for all, for all students. Um, and this, that this would start September 7th, uh, day after Labor Day, and then it would, uh, uh, hopefully we can end this thing uh, by, uh, uh, actually uh, October 29th is a, is a Friday. So that would be the um, the uh, date, the ending date. Okay. September 7th through October 29th. Okay, a motion has been made and clarified by Mr. Persis that we have an emergency adoption of policy 503, a mandatory face covering um, to begin on Tuesday, September 7th to end Friday, October 29th. Is there a second? There's no second, so the, the motion has failed. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. So I'd like to make a motion. I 
Yes, my, sir. Go my, ahead. My issue would be I don't think that 60 days is I, I don't agree with the 60 days. I was thinking more along the lines of 45 days, which would take us, and, and I agree with the start date, which gives families an opportunity to go to their doctors and healthcare professionals uh, should they need to. Um, so I was looking at, so 30 days would be the 28th or 45, so it would end on October 12th. Is that a school board meeting day? If, if I may, um, uh, oh, wait, wait a minute. Madam Chair, the there is a there is a natural break if you're looking for something like that. The end, the end of, of the, the quarter. The end of the first quarter, I believe, is uh, uh, staff could could help us here, but I think it's right around October the fifth, the fifteenth, or fourteenth. I'm okay with October the 14th. October 15th? Well, the 15th we have uh, a meeting right. with the county. So I'd say the 4th, so ending, well, the 12th, we have, school, we have a school board meeting on the 12th. So it would be a, a mask. Again, we are anticipating that the numbers will start to go down. And like I said, I, I would not agree that we are on the downward trend, but I think we have peaked and we are doing this right now. Um, so uh, I think that it would be prudent to have mitigating efforts all the way until the 12th, and then on the 12th we can re-examine that uh, and decide then. So that is my motion. Okay, Okay. now is there no opt-outs? Because you talked about people talking about medical. I'm sorry? So I, I agree with a medical opt-out. In other words, they can go to their psychologist, their medical doctor, uh, anyone who is familiar with their care and provide that information if they uh, require a medical opt-out. And I would also, and, and I don't know how to put this into words, um, some sort of an ESC exception for students who we know, you know it's, in, in certain instances, it's more important for the adults to protect themselves then the children have the ability to protect themselves in some of our classrooms. So um, I think that would also be prudent and those students can, you know, and Ms. Haynes says that if the kid can't take it off himself, you know, he probably should not have it on. And I agree with that. And again, I'm making my thought process on the basis that children are not learning and, and uh, we can't continue the cycle right now. So that's my motion. Okay, could you restate it clearly? So it would be a uh, mandatory mask mandate uh, beginning on September 7th, 7th mm -hmm. all the way until the school board meeting of the 12th, at which point we will reevaluate and decide uh, whether or not uh, we are out of the woods and can uh, make other decisions. Okay, thank you. You've heard his motion. Is there a second? Okay, Mr. Second Persis. Is I would just, uh, I, I, would, I would feel better maybe even if it was just right to the end of that week. We could make the decision on the 12th. You hear what I'm saying? But if we decided, then it would be, it would be the first day of the next grading period. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to. Um, well, let's go with uh, Mr. Yeah. Colon has made a motion. Yeah, and, and can okay. we get clar clarification? Is that the end of the grading period? Because I could be wrong on that. And if, if I am, just can someone tell I us? I don't have it marked on my calendar. Dr. Dr. B, can you, can you check the end of the well, grading when's period? When's the end of the first quarter one? one? Yeah, that's what I thought too. And I thought that was probably in, uh, in uh, ISE day on the 15th, perhaps the student's last day is the 14th. Is that right? 15th, is that a teacher duty day? No, Monday is the teacher duty day. Oh, okay. Okay, so Friday is the student's last day of the grading period. Okay, 
Okay, one more time. Restate your motion, please, Mr. Colon. Uh, it is a mask mandate lasting from September 7th until, Dr. Fritz, do you see any advantage to the 15th over the 12th? Uh, just going to the end of the quarter. I mean, you know, but it, it's your motion. We'll make it work whenever you need to make it work. I'll go with the 12th, just because we have a meeting that day. Well, here's the, here's the caveat. We could okay, well, change wait it. Wait a minute. Right? Just, so we will discuss it during, but let's yeah. see. He's made a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it, yes. Okay. Mr. Persis has seconded the motion. Yeah. Okay, it's now open for discussion. Is there someone who would like to make a comment? Yes, I have questions. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, so Mr. Persis and Mr. Colon, what is your ultimate outcome? And I'd like to hear from each of you based on the fact that you have made the motion and you have seconded this motion. What is it that you are looking for? What is the outcome that you want? That's my first question. Mr. Colon. Decline in quarantines. What? Decline in quarantines and decline in cases in children. Thank you. Mr. Persis? Yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And uh, I think we may be able to, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping through this that we're, we are, what is it, modifying or uh, a, a, adopting a new quarantine protocol, Dr. Fritz? I'm just not sure which, which it is, but I think that would help to reduce the number of people quarantined too. Okay, so you're talking two separate issues. So you're talking one issue of like mandating mask only with a medical opt-out, which you're saying, okay, you'll take from a medical doctor or a psychologist or something like that, but you're, okay, today is Tuesday. So you're saying parents can make an appointment to get a medical opt-out Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday of this week. And you think that actually can happen so that when they come back on Tuesday the 7th, they could have a medical opt-out. You think that's feasible to get into an appointment to see a psychologist or a medical doctor to get a medical opt-out? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, uh, if it's not Friday, it's Tuesday or the Wednesday, I mean, I'm, you know, that they will get it as, as, soon, as, as soon as possible. Um, uh, okay. I'm sure they will. My next question. So you believe, so, because we're talking two different things here. You're talking about mandating a mask. You're only talking about giving a medical opt-out. You're only talking about a three-day window, which means even if they go call tomorrow, there's no way that they're going to get an appointment to get a medical opt-out. But you're saying this goes into effect Tuesday the 7th. Then you're also talking about changing the quarantining procedures. So I'm assuming then you're talking about no longer following this quarantining procedure, and I'm not sure what quarantining procedure you're, you're saying. So you believe with a medical, with a mandated mask, with only a medical opt-out and changing quarantine, you're gonna drop numbers. We've already dropped numbers because Friday's numbers on the dashboard were much lower than the first two weeks. Is that what I'm hearing, gentlemen? Yes, but our quarantines are not. Because does, does I got a generic quarantine Excuse letter. Excuse me, sir. Sorry. Please let us continue the, uh, with our meeting. The Department of Health, the Department of Health one, was Florida Department of Education, by the Surgeon General that's appointed by the Governor and the uh, Commissioner of Education, is putting kids out unnecessarily. I mean, so, if we continue to follow that, we're you know what, we might as well just throw out the baby with the bathwater because kids are being quarantined, like you said, Jamie, by the hundreds. And I don't know many people who are as passionate about children learning as you are. And kids, all of these things are great, except these kids are not in school. They're going home. Okay, so and what is the different quarantining procedure that's going to take place by mandating a mask that's going to keep our kids in school? Because last year we sent them home when they were wearing masks behind plexiglass Correct. spread out. So Ms. Boswell's explained that they, we didn't have this guidance last year from the CDC. Where is this guidance? The CDC. The CDC guidelines. Okay, so wh what are we switching to, gentlemen? So the CDC. for starters, 
No, I need to understand. I mean, you can't just say CDC and nobody knows what's the criteria for CDC. Uh, Let them explain. Go ahead. So it takes into account if two students are wearing a mask, okay, and they are, there is a known exposure, and I bet you Ms. Ms. Rowland could probably speak better to this than I can. There is a known exposure. In other words, they weren't just in the room. Right now, the way that, that the Florida Department of Education one says, if they're in the room, they're going out. We sent whole rooms home last year. Well, that's my point. So we don't have to send them all because it would have to be a known exposure to that person who was infected. It's a different set of rules. And like she said, this is new from the CDC in their new guidance that says with a mask, okay, and I tell you, I said, Chancellor will leave a message, said, man, you're killing us because we're sending kids home for no reason. We are sending them home for no reason. And he pointed to the Department of Health, okay? But right now, I mean, we, kids are not learning. They're not in school. So is your primary thing for children to learn? Yes. And if they're not in school, they're not learning. Okay. And so, so I think that we could curve the numbers I think that with the downward trend, I think that with the mask taking into the CDC mask guidance for quarantining, we won't have to send home as many kids as we're sending home right now because it's ridiculous. And this is new guidance. This wasn't there last year. Okay, so primary goal though is children to have the opportunity to learn. Correct. All right. Children be in school. Be in school, period. Because you have no control over whether they're in school or not. We have no control, that's the health department. They go by state statute, they go off of contact tracing, they do all that stuff that they do, which they have a statutory responsibility to do. So they're not in school and we have no control over that. And they are sending them home left and right. Heritage, poof, two, 300 kids, poof. Just like that. Citrus Grove, how many well, kids and are I'm home Well, and I'm trying Grove? to understand how you putting in a mass mandate is gonna change that because not everybody will have to go home. Okay, nobody has explained, no one has explained to me yet the difference of how we're going to keep kids here. Because last year, we followed CDC guidance and we sent entire classrooms, entire grade levels home all the time. Right, that has changed. Okay. Except we got the state guidance. Did I? Okay, I need someone to tell me okay. is the where the two of you are going and how this is going to be different. It would be different just adopting the other, uh, the CDC guidelines for the quarantine. You know, even if we, if we kept the mask optional, and kept our same quarantine guidelines, we'd still be sending a lot of, look where we are now. Masks are optional right now. They've been optional the first three weeks of school. Look what our quarantine well, We're two days into are. week number three. Okay, but look where our numbers are. And well, people keep thinking about, about uh, when they're not, when they're not in, in school. You know, to me, the point is not where they get COVID, it's when they bring it to school and spread it. And that's what these help prevent, the spread of it. It's not, it's not that I'm thinking children are getting COVID necessarily at, at school, but some of them are. But we don't know where some of them are getting it. I mean, it's, it's hard because they're only in school a certain amount of time. But the deal, deal is when they do have it, then we gotta do all this contract tracing and it takes all that time and then the, all this quarantining and it's just detrimental. It's detrimental to everyone, but to the child, it. to the parents, to the teacher. I mean, there, there's not any good coming from this. Okay, you so have all not. I'm trying to do, all we're trying to do is reduce the number of students who are quarantined, put a mask on for, what is this, six weeks, and reduce the spread which will in effect reduce the number of children who will be quarant quarantined so that we can get back to normal as quickly as possible. If, it's, if it happens before October the 12th, that's even better. But I just think we, I, we just think we have to do something because of the way the numbers are. 
Okay, so the 17%, as I said, of the time that they're actually on campus, that you're now going to mandate that they wear a mask with a medical opt-out, and then there was something said about our ESE students. Um, so right there, you're gonna have what percentage of kids on campus that are not going to be wearing them, and you know, what we've heard is it's either everybody wears it and does their part, or no, it spreads, right? So which is it? Is it everybody wears it and does their part, but if I'm sitting in a room, and two of the students in this room aren't wearing it, then have we not just, I mean, are we not back to where we already are with the, the choice? I'm trying to understand, come Tuesday the 7th, if you push this through, what is changing? I need to clearly understand what is changing. Because like, am I gonna see then on next Wednesday's dashboard, all of a sudden it's only six people out? No, I don't think you'll see that. Tuesday's dashboard. Um, because why don't we start with change? Like, I, I agree, these guidelines are ridiculous this year, okay? So why don't we start by going back to the CDC guidelines so and the, following the CDC guidelines before we so go we and are. say, we're gonna pull the rug out parents from under you after we told you you had a choice. Because here's the thing, everybody wants to say this is anti-mask versus pro-mask. Choice is everybody makes a choice. I mean, we've got parents that are sending masks with their kids and their kids are making, like, even get a choice. Some are saying, no, you're gonna wear it and you're gonna wear it the whole time. Some are like, well, you don't have to wear it. Others are sending it. So we're taking choice away. When did choice become such a bad thing? I really wanna know. It's not, we gave them choice. You know what, here's where I'm choice at. Wait, I you, stand- Miss Miss Haynes. Please, you you had you ask them a question. Let them and, answer. And nobody can answer it. Hold on, I'm well, coming. Let them answer. All right. Thank so you. the new guidelines. First question: Did the student come into contact within six feet for 15 minutes with a student who has COVID? The 15 minutes could be consecutive or three blocks, five minutes over the day. In other words, cumulative. If yes, what happened next defend, depends on additional factors. If the student is vaccinated, if the student is fully vaccinated, they should be referred to for testing but do not need to quarantine. If the student is not vaccinated, the next questions are just how close were they to the infected peer? Whether both were masked and if the exposure happened in a classroom. If the student was in a classroom at least three feet from the infected student and both students were wearing masks the whole time, the exposed student does not have to quarantine. But if the students were less than three feet in the classroom, less than, or less than six feet apart anywhere else in the school, or either student was unmasked, quarantining is necessary. So they are taking into account students who are wearing masks. Where that's new, that is absolutely new. The guidance we have from FLDOE is sending everybody home, that none of that matters. So we have, a more, so we have a more contagious variant, that's what everybody keeps saying. But this time we're saying, now, it, it, does it say if they're wearing it correctly? Does it say depending on what kind they're wearing? We're not saying any of that. You know, this is, again, these are the folks who have provided the guidance to schools. See, we have two sets of rules. We can either continue to send kids home, which is what we have with FLDOE, or we can do nothing and continue to send kids home. That's where we're at. So if the idea is we really want to educate children here? Yes. It is, right? Yes, absolutely. And you know I believe in choice. No, you do. But if we're to the point that what we're really saying is we want to educate children, and the only way to safely educate children is to make sure they don't come into contact with someone that tests positive with COVID, right? Right. Because really either way we could run into they still have to go home right not if we follow that guidance okay, okay but uh, all right here's the thing then I'm I'm going to make a suggestion send them all home send them all home I don't believe in it I believe in learning face to face but if you really want to stop this virus and you want to stand by every child getting their education, send every child home to learn. If you think that's what it's gonna to take to stop it, slow it down, 
I don't think this is going to make the difference. Now, we supposedly have already peaked and we're going down, but nobody wants to talk about that, all right? Send them all home. Send them all home. Have the teachers report to their classrooms, provide live instruction following their schedule for the day, and let's teach these kids. Because then we don't have to quarantine anybody. We don't have to worry if they're vaccinated, unvaccinated. We don't have to worry about if they've got a mask on, not got a mask on, wearing it correctly, three feet, six feet, 15 minutes, five minute intervals. I mean, seriously. I mean, I have sat here and listened to all of this, and where's the common sense? I mean, I want children. I'm the one that stood here last year saying, we're opening schools. We're allowing children to come back into classrooms to learn. We played this game all last year. We did every mitigating strategy and still sent how many children home that never got sick. Now, we told everybody what the plan was for this year. Now you want to pull the plan out. Yes. Whether you want to pull it out for 15 days, 45 days, 60 days. When did we get to decide that we know more and we can, we can determine what we're medically going to do for kids? And only a medical opt-out? We told them the plan and we we're sending them home every single day. Then let's send them all home to learn. And that's not within our reach. Why not? Statutorily. So, I mean, again, we could play anecdotal, but the reality is that's not within You're our You're the reach. one that brought up the, I, the, I, I the district that sent their kids home right now. Well, they had to. So, well, are again, we, I can't Are we speak, at that point I, that we have to send them home? That was your suggestion. So, again, with all due respect, that's my motion. Um, I, think, I think that this will help. I am, again... I didn't agree with the 60 days. I'm agreeing with the shorter time period in hopes that we can make a difference. And that's my motion. Okay. The motion has been made. It's been seconded. Um, we've heard from Ms. Haynes. Um, Ms. Burnett? I'm really struggling with the, the medical only um, opt out, being that there's only a few days. And there's there are just some kids that don't have um, access to physicians there some, and sending them to the ED or to the urgent care is, is not really what you want to do in this environment. Um, I, would, I would suggest a um, parent opt out. Okay, but right now the motion we have to continue with what the motion is on the floor. Thank you for your suggestion. Okay. Um, something what we already have right now is an optional, and Correct. it is that is similar to what you, you you're saying. Um, what Mr. Colon has mentioned is that um, there would be a mandatory face covering for a period of about 40 45 days till the end of the quarter to see if the numbers go down. What he's suggesting and what Mr. Persis has seconded is adding another layer of protection to what we're already doing. Um, everyone has, and I believe everyone has agreed, from, we've heard from both sides tonight, have said a multi-layered approach is really the, the best. And what's different from last year to this year is the Delta variant, which is much more transmissible and it does not does not distinguish between the elderly nor the young people. So um, they are suggesting just to see it. It's not for the whole year. It's just to check to see if the numbers go down. If the, and it takes a little while for it to take effect. If the numbers go down, we will go back and re reverse this. That's what they're saying. We'll just, just want to see. Because it's just another layer of protection for our students. And that's what that is. Okay. So then I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. So if they show up next Tuesday and they don't have a mask on, what are you doing? What are you doing to kids? I want to know. Because I think we're right back where we were last year when you had a very strict mandate you came out with, and it was called, we're going to discipline children. That's a good question, and I was going to ask that 
to Dr. Fritz too. Uh, I don't know what, what is the plan if the children that decide to come to school without a mask. Well, I mean, if, if you make it a mandate, it's a mandate. I mean, if you make it a mandate, then compliance has to happen or, or the child can't stay in school. So if you make it an option, like Ms. Burnett was saying, then it would be a, a choice. But if you make it a mandate for 45 days or whatever, then it would be something that families and students would be expected to comply with. Well, I mean, I, you're gonna have to give direction to principals how to deal with that I mean yeah I mean, we would we would call them we would they would parent would have to come pick up their child or they'd have to have an opportunity to choose another option you know um, but Wait, please please this is please let us discuss this so we can figure it out please excuse us please go ahead sir so I could do it with the board's pleasure. If you want me to open up another online opportunity for families, I can, I can try to do that. I can, I can work with HR to see where we, we get some teachers and we, we would open that up for a brief period. It, it couldn't be indefinitely um, that we could do that if that was the choice parents chose to make. But if you make something mandatory, understand that that's, that means it has to happen. Any further discussion? So you're trying to keep kids in school, but if they don't show up with a mask, you're sending them home so they miss out on their learning. <laughs> what, we're, what we're trying to do is to stop the spread of the virus as quickly as possible so that not only will we have fewer children infected, but we will have fewer children needing to quarantine. It's not perfect. It wasn't perfect last year. I don't intend this is not going to be perfect. There will be children who don't wear their mask right and have dirty masks and do all those things that they did last year. But last year we didn't have near the numbers, not even close to the numbers that we have this year. And so we put all, all these things in place last, last year and we kept it, I guess some would say somewhat manageable. But it's not manageable right, right now and we're only two and a half weeks in, into the school year. So we just can't pretend like, well, let's just, let's just hope that it just drops. But what if it doesn't? What if it goes the other way? So that's all, that's all I think that we're trying, trying to say is let's, let's be honest, let's look at the numbers. They are way higher than, than they were last, last year, both, both the number of quarantine and the number that have COVID and staff too. So we have to do something. We have to do something. And uh, wearing a mask, you know, to me is a minor sacrifice for anyone to have to, have to make. I mean, it, it, it really is. And we're not saying this is gonna be the way it's gonna be for the whole, the whole year. I mean, as soon as, uh, as soon as we see this thing, you know, start to drop and quarantine less and fewer kids get, get infected, um, then we can make it optional again. But uh, I just would not feel comfortable saying, well, it's not so bad, let's just let it go. I mean, we have too many kids out, too many staff have members out, we, have, we can't get substitutes, we, you know, we have, we have some empty classrooms. We have com combined classes. We, this is not the way to start the school year. So we have to take, you know, some would call this drastic measures. Some call it just putting the mask back on. Uh, that, you know, I, I don't want to do it. I, I don't. I was hoping for for the best. That's why I I didn't even think about mandatory mask. Uh, before the school year started. I thought things were gonna be fine, but it, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse, and I'm just to the point now where I just can't just let it ride anymore. We, we, we gotta do something different. And this is, I think, a logical step to take. Mr. Colon? 
I'll amend my motion. I'm sorry, sir. I'll amend my motion. You amend your motion. You a good point about access to health care, which will give an additional three days. So, I mean, that's really operational. So they'll have all of next week to provide that letter. Because I think there was, I know that one of the counties did like a five-day grace period or whatever. So effective Tuesday the 7th with an additional three-day grace period. In other words, the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. That's a grace period. And then obviously that Monday the 13th, if they have not been able to get to their doctor, that gives them eight days to get to the doctor and get that medical exemption. So really it's just adding a three day grace period, the eighth, the ninth, and the 10th. Okay, and then, okay, then reiterate, you're going to um, 10, 15, the end of the quarter? What's that? Then you, you, you're going, you've amended. Um, and we can go to the 15th, that's fine. Okay. So I'll amend it to go to the 15th. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I put in to ask another question. Yes, ma'am. So, gentlemen, would you not even consider, I mean, you're, you're talking about changing two major things. You're also talking about putting a burden on families. You're talking about some families that don't have health care, don't have a doctor right away that they could get into. So, would you not be willing to consider that the first step we take, I mean, think about it, Dr. Shanoff came up and shared the air piece we've met which, you know, I don't think that was even a piece last year, all right? We've got all of the PPE there that they should be using. He told me they're going through a lot of wipes that the middle and high schools are ordering to wipe down the area. Yeah. What, if we, what if we start and change the guidelines that we're following for quarantining? And if we put out what the guidelines are that we're going to move and instead of following this set that's sending hundreds of kids home, we follow the CDC guidance, very clearly put it out to parents, it's still leaving mask a choice, we may find that some of them may choose it if they now know their child's not going to be quarantined. I still go by this, don't send your child to school sick. That didn't work. Keep them home. Well, uh, my understanding, Madam Chair, was in relation to that was we are gonna start using the new quarantine procedures immediately. I mean, why haven't we used I mean, them from day one? I, well, because we wanted to do what the governor asked us to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. That came from the Florida Department of Education. Well, the governor the, asked us to give parents a choice about face masks. the Department of Health. It, it came from the Department of Education it as well. It came from the Department of Education. Okay, but and we were so, asked to give parents a choice, and we have parental rights bill. If that's the case, then you know what? We would just keep sending kids home. That's what you're saying. Oh, you said send them all home, but I'm just saying. I mean, we're picking and choosing what we're going to follow here. Depends. Excuse us, please. Let us continue so, our discussion. Again, I, I just, you know, Jamie, if you're okay with them continuing to send folks home, because the I've difference never... between the CDC guidance and that right there is the mask. The, what makes the difference in that number of who's going home and who's not is the mask. There's also a difference between the feet. We're talking six feet on this one, three feet on the other one. Yep. Right? Oh, I mean, and as I said, the minute they sit down for lunch, they exceed the 15 minutes and they have no mask on. Right. And that's how it's always been. No, well, no, because last year when they sat down for lunch, they were all facing one direction behind plexiglass. Not, not every school. Well, not a lot of school. them. Not every place. Trust and, me. and I agree with you on a lot of the things you said as far as the mitigation efforts. I tell you, we, we didn't start the school year telling teachers, please socially distance the kids. We didn't. We were all hoping that this year would be That's no right. different. And, you know, yeah, a lot of the things slacked off. I mean, I don't know that every classroom is wiping desks anymore. We're probably not doing that as much as we were before. I don't even know that we're, you know, 
And, and the other thing I asked Dr. Shanoff, I said, do we have enough masks to put in place that right after lunch, every student who has a mask that's not a home mask can get a new mask? And he said, Reuben, we have masks galore. And I, and I understand that, you know, part of the concerns is that the kids wear them all day, and that's fair. I mean, that's nasty, okay? And mind you, when I'm at work, I wear one all day long, okay? And so, you know, I wear a mask all day long. Change it out two and three times so we have enough masks. Or so, you know, I'm going into, you know, uh, yes, we have to bring back a lot of the things we were doing, but... Uh, to curb this quickly, I mean, we've got 1,300 kids quarantined. How many of those kids are gonna come back positive? A handful. And so they're going out for at least five days. And if they go to CVS or Walgreens, the test to get the test back is gonna take three days. And they can't take it until day, so I'm being conservative with the five days. So, I mean, they're not in school. And we don't have live anymore. We don't have, so, I mean, just the burden on the families, these kids. I mean, when folks come to the ER and say, please give me a letter so I don't lose my job because I've got to take care of my kids. That's it. I mean, this is impacting the whole community. And I'm not even going into what I've seen because I'm not even sharing any of that. Okay? Because there's only one person in this room that has done CPR on three people under the age of 40 this week. One. That's me. One, two of which had five kids apiece. And I'm not even going there. I'm simply talking about all of these kids going home and without us making our own guidance, this is what exists that we can follow. And that's what I'm talking about because families cannot continue. Families in my community, maybe in other communities they can, in my community, families cannot continue to miss work because every other week their kids are, I mean, we heard kids come up here and say, I'm already quarantined. That's a bummer. If we you're taking Algebra 1, if you're taking those classes, if you're in Cambridge. So that's just, that's just my feeling. Thank you. Okay, and call uh, for the vote. Yeah, I, I oh. wanted to make sure I understood the date of the, uh, of the oh. exemption. He changed the, yeah, so it would give them until the Friday of the following Friday, week. the 10th. Right, and then after that, it's a dead stop or dead enforcement starting the 13th, and we'll take it to the 15th. I amend my motion if you want a second. Okay, restate that again clearly for so the it record. So would be a mask mandate from September 7th. 7th through the 15th, allowing a grace period all the way to the 10th, which will give families eight days to get to their physicians. And that is my motion. But, but here's what I don't un understand. Today's August 31st, right. tomorrow is September 1st. So September 1st through September 8th is seven days. We have a holiday though too. So my understanding, um, Mr. Cologne, was that you would want it to start on the 7th, yes. and the grace period would be the re remaining of that week, and then it would be in full effect with the medical opt-out on the 13th, Correct. Monday the 13th. Correct. So what, is, what does the grace period mean? That it if is I come to, a child comes to school without a mask on the 7th, there isn't any... Discipline gives, or anything because well, that's hopefully the more will be coming to school with a mask, but we're give, we're allowing families to be able to get to their doctors or medical personnel in order to get a letter to bring to school for the opt out. It it just seems to me that what you're saying is that it's not going to take effect till the thirteenth. He's that's trying it. to he's trying to, I guess, uh, uh, allow. Families to be able to have that opportunity to find because she's trying to address what Miss Haynes had said about they're not going to be able to get there in a couple of days because today is Tuesday, tomorrow's Wednesday, so it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week. Monday's a holiday, so it gives them three days this week and seven and four days next week. 
Okay, so my, my next question is, as far as the quarantining protocol adopting the CDC guidelines, can that start tomorrow? Yes, I, I can get with staff and we can start working with Department of Health as early as tomorrow. So we don't have to, they don't have to coincide, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm Quarantining sorry. rules can start that's a immediately. Ms. Ms. Rowland's in the room and she's in charge of the team, so we can start tomorrow with that. Okay, and with the CDC, what's different between the CDC guidelines and the Department of Health that was told to us by the Department of Education is the mask. And it's the and quarantine, and, the and it's and to allow feet. more and more students um, to stay in school and not be quarantined. And the CDC guidelines really uh, benefit uh, those students who are wearing masks mm -hmm. and those right. students who have been vaccinated. If you're not wearing yes. a mask and you're not vaccinated, the CDC guidelines aren't going to really help. Correct, correct. And then the CDC is three feet distance as opposed to six feet. Okay, any other discussion? I do have a few more questions. So you're talking about really this starting on Monday, September 13th, running through Friday, October 15th. You're talking about immediately changing to CDC guidelines. You're talking about only a medical opt-out, which is forcing parents to have to and, and quite frankly, you got to understand this. We've got parents that don't have the means or the money to go even. Okay, you're, I need to know what ages you're including in this. Would be all students. So pre-K, three-year-olds, because we have pre-K ESE three-year-olds through ESE twenty-one-year-olds. What did we do last year? All, all students. students. It's all students. No, we did not include any pre-k last year and we gave kindergarten even the option Did we? they, they were wearing them and uh, the uh, four-year-olds were, were wearing masks in pre-k so we're going to go pre-k through three-year-olds through ese 21 year olds so is this including buses I don't know what the cases were last year with pre-K, if, if that was an, an issue, and I'm fine with not having pre-K. Kindergarten up. Kindergarten up. Okay, is there it's any... It's K-12, so the recommendations are K-12. But we, there was something we did with kindergarten, I remember. Well, I don't think kindergartners, pardon me for interrupting, um, I don't think kindergartners were required to wear the masks, from what I remember, because COVID is different from the Delta variant. The Delta variant is not discriminating age, and that's the problem we're having. Okay. It's, there's no discrimination. All right. Well, it's attacking I, children. See, we need to figure all this out. Like, if you're going to go this route, because it appears you are, you, you need to have very clear guidance on what Let's you're doing. So you're talking pre-K three-year-olds through ESC 21-year-olds. Because so, that's our age span on so I campus. Think, I mean, so we can talk. That, those are the things we have to figure out once we decide if this is where the board is going. Because the reality is, again, I, and I value what you just said because I didn't even think about pre-K. And so because I'm not an educator. So these are things we can work out if this is the decision that we want to. So last year we also had the guidance in there that stated if a student could not put on a mask or remove it, they were not required to wear one. I agree with that. And La if their, I, if their I, IEP said they should wear a mask? Well, nobody's got that written in their IEP for this year because we took mask away as a choice. So when they held all their meetings to do their updated IEPs or reviews, that's not in their IEPs. Not so sure. It could be. It, could, it still could, could be. It depends on when their annual re right. review is coming. So let's see if we're, if, so here's my suggestion. Let's see if this is the desire of the board. Is it, if it is, then we can figure out those but moving would, parts. Yeah. I, That's just off the top. I'd be, I'd be wanting to do it just K through 12. 
not pre-K. Uh, you're talking about K through 12? K through 12. All right. Restate clearly your motion then, Mr. Uh, Colon. So my motion is a mask mandate. Face covering. Face covering mandate beginning on September no, with, 7th. With medical opt-out? Hold on. September 7th with a three-day grace period extending to the 10th, uh, allowing for medical opt-out ending on October 15th. Okay. And that'll give us time on the 12th to talk about it and decide whether or not we need to continue or we need to, uh, or we're safe to stop it. And that is my motion. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. I, I apologize for always asking, just making sure we're all aware, the public is aware of what's, what uh, we're suggesting and making the motion for. Yeah, and I, I, I'll second that. And uh, <laughs> is the understanding that's going to be K through 12. K so, through 12. So, yes. And following the 12. CDC guidelines. Yes. And following the CDC guidelines effective immediately. So, go ahead and put the discipline piece in it, too. I'm sorry, Ms. Haynes, what? I said please go ahead and put the discipline piece in it that you're requesting, too. I think it's going to come down to, didn't, what, what did we do last year? Well, last year it was mandatory, and parents had the option of doing the live or the online program. And that's why I said if the board tells me to go ahead and open up another period for parents to enroll during that same period of time um, up to the 13th, I, I could do that. We did not discipline last year. We handed a child a mask because everybody knew it was mandatory. I agree. But, yeah, I agree. But if they have a medical exemption, then they would not be offered a mask. No, but we've got parents right now that sent their kids back to us because we made it optional. And I don't think they're going to be happy when you try to hand their kid a mask to wear. So that's why I'm saying I, I need to understand what you're going to do to children. Because you're going to take their learning away well, from them. You're saying you, however, it's us. Yeah. We're a board. You've made the motion. We're the board. Well, we are a board. And when we walk out of here, it's the board's decision if that's the case. And at that so time, I'll do whatever the decision is. But right so, here's my thing. Right now, I, I can't support, if, if the whole idea is have children here so they can learn, I can't support sending kids home. Well, and so th this is, again, let's talk about it. That's why we're here. We're here to talk about it. And so again, if it is the desire of the board, and we'll find out in a minute, we can talk about these things. Because you know, you have an insight that I don't have. You have a lot of insights that I don't have, and I value those. And so if it is our decision, then we can talk about those things. Okay, Ms. Burnett. Yes, ma'am, thank you. So you had mentioned we could, there's some moving parts we could discuss later. Um, what about the, the um, people who are over 12 that are vaccinated? Are they still gonna have to wear a mask? Yeah, they would. Okay, and then what, uh, and so the. Because, the, because you can still spread it. Okay. I mean, you can be asymptomatic and you can spread it. <laughs> And so the other one is, is um, and because I wasn't so, here so last I, year. So it says, mm -hmm. if, 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 yeah, if, a, if yes, what happens next depends on a few additional factors. If the student exposed is vaccinated, if the student is fully vaccinated, they should be referred for testing, but do not need to quarantine. So there is provision in there for that as well. Okay. And then um, children that, um, do have ESC needs and they can't wear one, they can't tolerate it, is that going to require a medical opt-out or is that part of, and I think you were talking about that a second ago, but forgive me because I wasn't here last year when all this occurred. Um, so the ESC kids who can't wear them, do they have to go get the medical opt-out or is that just part of their plan? I think you need to be clear on what that's going to be. You said one thing earlier, if a child cannot put it on their face or take it off, um, then it would not be required. But I think we, we're going to need clear direction because staff's going to have to know how to follow through with that if it's an exceptional student education student. So what you had said earlier, if, if a student could not put on or take off, 
by themselves, then it would not be required. Correct. And that's true. And you know, it reminds me of a CPAP mask at work. If a patient's not awake enough to be able to take it off should they throw up right. inside of it, then it's not a safe mechanism and we intubate. So I, I agree with that. You know, and I, and I think we know who those kids are. We know who they are. You know, and I know Jamie's looking at me because even though last year we said a lot of things were not going to happen, and they did, I get it. But, I mean, again, to do nothing is not an option. Kids are not learning. Okay, there's a call to the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. 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 The, the motion has passed three to two. I think we're adjourned unless there's further well, discussion. So, no, so I, I do have more to say. Though. All right, Mr. Cologne would like to say something. So, Dr. So, Dr. Fritz. So, Dr. Fritz, as far as the other mitigating factors that we need to put back in place, because you know, again, we started the school year like nothing had happened. Can we get some of those mitigating factors back in place? I'm sorry, Mr. Cologne, I really can't hear you. <laughs> so, everything that involves the wiping of the desks and all those things, can we get all of those things back in place in addition to this so that we can... I'm sorry, I'm trying to hear you. I'm sorry, Mr. Cologne, I couldn't hear you. So, we spoke about the layers of mitigation. Is there a way that we can start to, for example, you know, social distancing in the classroom? We really didn't start the year thinking we would be there, even though, you know, start to look at those things that we did last year that worked, you know, making sure that the teachers have the stuff they need to wipe the desks, you know, the kids to wipe the desks. We're not doing that stuff this year. And we have a more contagious virus, yet we stopped those mitigation efforts. So, maybe take a look at what we did last year and try again to do some of that to see if it'll make a difference. Yes, sir. And also, another thing, guys, what do you guys think of our dashboard? It sucks. And I know that last year we tried not to... The dashboard. The dashboard. I know with last year, because the numbers were so small, we were concerned with... We were concerned with folks being identified. But now with the numbers being so high, I think it's important that the public see how many kids are being quarantined. Because they have no idea that there's 1,300 kids who are going to be out of school for the next week. They have no clue. So... Mr. Colon is speaking. He has the floor. Thank you. Mr. Colon, please continue. So, I think that it's important that, you know, because you have... People have no idea how many... How this is impacting the school district. You look at Seminole County, they're up to 7,000 total for the year. Quarantine. So, again... That's disgusting. You guys are kicking me out. Disgusting. You should all be ashamed. This is disgusting. Good night, sir. Good night to you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. Please continue. Are you finished, sir? So, no, that was it. So, I think we really need to relook at our dashboard and also... I think it could use some defining because I think there's a lot of confusing... Confusion out there. A lot of folks are saying, you know, there are cases at my school. I don't see it on here. So, also provide some clarity there. I think right now a lot of that's being done manually and where it could be a Power BI dashboard. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Yes, Ms. Hain. So, the bottom line is that you still haven't laid out all the parameters of what you're doing. What you've said is you're mandating a mask starting on Tuesday, September 7th with a three-day grace period to get a medical opt-out running through Friday, October 15th. 
You right. did exclude pre-K. That is the only group, but you're doing this K through 12, and you did exclude children that cannot put it on or remove it themselves. You still did not address buses. You still did not address outdoor recess. You did not address PE. You did not address any of the events. You didn't address football games, wrestling, basketball games. You didn't address the prom. You didn't address any of that. So let's talk about it. So, no, I mean. I, I didn't adjourn the, I, w I wasn't the one that tried to adjourn the meeting because I thought there was more discussion to be had. I mean, you didn't address, you didn't address, can it be face shields versus face mask? I mean, you didn't address any of that. I mean, you guys, you just, you just made a rule and said this is the way it's gonna be and said, oh, by the way, switch the guidance and oh, maybe now we should go into looking at the mitigating factors that we haven't been doing. So let's talk about it. So let's go down the list. I'm okay with that. Okay. So, so go on, you, you, you have a great list and it's, it's a great list. Buses. I believe mass should be required on the yeah. buses. It's yeah. K through 12. Yes. All right. Recess and outdoor PE. Remember, we talked about that. That's a no. I'm not required. This is indoor only. Oh, okay. That's that wasn't part of the thing. So this is indoor only. Yes. Just as it I mean, was when we the agree. year. Just as it was when the year started. Okay, so you have mandated a mask with only a medical opt-out for indoor only. Does that include indoor gymnasium? And does that include indoor sports and indoor activities such as band and things such as that? I believe we had provisions in there for gym and exercise and all that, didn't we? No, last year, we did, if they were indoors, we made them wear them. If they were outdoors, we let them not. I'm asking. Indoor gym, yes. So I can't imagine playing basketball with a mask on in the gym. Because that's, I mean, you're exercising. So what are our thoughts? I mean, there's five of us here. We're here for a reason. So, so my thought on that is it, it's exercise and it's kind of contraindicated with that. And, but yet you're, it, it doesn't make sense to have them on in the, in the gym, but yet we're saying that they have to. Did I miss something? No, oh. no, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's, it's, you know, that's why there's five of us. You're right. No, agreed. Um, but I mean, if you're exercising, but the whole point is, is you're, you, if you're playing basketball, you're sweating, you're probably breathing heavier, but yet it's hard to wear a mask while you're doing that exercise. Did we make them wear it last year in the gym? Yeah. I didn't think we did. I don't know. I have to go back and look. Um, didn't we have two football games last Friday? Uh, canceled. One on the east side, one on the west side that were canceled because of COVID and quarantines. We held Deltona High and University High and it was crowded. Now, some, some um, if they're on our campus, they probably we have to follow the mask mandate. If now, for example, New Smyrna plays at the municipal stadium, uh, Daytona plays at the Daytona municipal stadium, that's not school board property. Uh, I don't, what did we do last year? So here, it's I think a, we, social outside. Distance. So here, we social distanced. We social distanced last year. So this is last year. In strenuous physical activity, including but not limited to walking, running, jogging, while engaged in sports or other activities while indoors or outdoors, where social distancing can be maintained. That's what we did last year. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? It says in strenuous, so general exceptions. In strenuous phys physical activity, including but not limited to walking, running, jogging, while engaged in sports or other physical activities, while indoors or outdoors, where social distancing can be maintained. So there was an exception for a wearing a mask. physical activity. We also added the social distancing. 
and then in the cafeterias, everyone was facing um, the same way. Again, these are all the, I mean, th those mitigating things are district things, things that we could, you know, Dr. Fritz could say, this is how we're gonna do this in an attempt to, so, you know, I don't, I don't know that, I mean, we can go down the list, so, I mean, again. Well, uh, listen, we, without knowing where the board went, I, I do need to bring one up, because I already talked to my principals and we made a decision that we would allow homecoming. Um, if, if, if it's, a, it's a voluntary event, it's not mandatory. Um, it's one that p parent, or they can choose. They will have it on their campus. It'll be after hours. And you can always say they can have it. With, they must have to wear a mask because they're going to be inside. But we did say that that event would be a permitted. And I'd hate to take that away from the schools at this that's point because they've already started their planning. Yeah, don't take that away. Yeah, that's your right. call. So I, I'd like to allow that to be permitted and to work with the principals um, yeah. to make sure that that can still happen. That was your call last year. That's so. a district function. That's I think so. I agree. Yeah. What else, Jamie? What else did we? We miss? cut field trips out last year. We've already approved field trips for this year. I wouldn't take those away. So I mean, again, let's let's take these away. I mean, oh, let's not put them back or whatever. We don't have them. Well, what, what we've said already, and just so you know what we said, if a teacher feels like they need that in the classroom or a student feels comfortable, then we allowed them then, to put that up. Then, but but that it's not comes, mandatory. But then with that comes the cleaning of it. You know, it's just another thing to clean. It's and not we, a whole lot of it. We were just told that the air is circulating more than enough. So this is blocking it. That's what it does. Traps it right in between. Well, we could follow the recommendation. So it's a false well sense of uh, so and it, I would suggest uh, we continue to allow open house with some guidelines and restrictions that are coming up. And we have the policy now for adults as well, we so do. that's not changing. And again, that's an optional event. Yeah. yeah. What else, Jamie? Did we get everything? Dr. Fritz, what do you say? I, I didn't hear the question. I mean, are there any other things? That you I mean, open house was the big one. Homecoming are, are the events that are popping up. I think the CDC guidelines says outdoor activities, you do not need to wear a mask. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Rose, is that? Yes, okay. So I think you're safe with football games and outdoor events and things like that. Um, spectators inside for like volleyball and things like that where you're close together. The CDC would say that people should have masks on but clearly not athletes when you're doing strenuous activity. Um, I have a principal's meeting tomorrow at 10.30 where I can kind of review this with them so that they understand how to govern the campus have and the we, timeline. Have we had to cancel a foot football game yet? We've had two that have been canceled uh, last, last Friday due to uh, cases, positive cases. Well, you know, this is only in effect for I think it's 25 days now or something like that so um, dr fritz were they so canceled because of exposure or because of positive quarantine they, they were quarantined um which meant somebody was exposed somebody was positive and and the, and the teams were exposed they, the coaching staff were exposed okay any further discussion okay we are adjourned Thank you Thank and good you. night.